student that um, very simple uh, introductory uh, material in performance modeling is enough for them to get to help them get a paper into ISCA and NSTI and SICOM, etc. They don't need to learn a whole lot of stuff. Thank you. I, I have more questions, but maybe other people want to ask them first, and then I'll get back to, to questions if, uh, if there's still room. I'm worried about have, the time. Uh, yeah, we have a, a certain uh, time allocated for discussion then, so I suggest we move. So since you are all very famous uh, presenters, I will cut the time from introductions. You can maybe talk a little bit about yourselves in the beginning, right? And uh, let's uh, go to the second presenter. And uh, uh, Maria, can you share and start? Uh, so, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody, depending where you are, uh, since we are distributed around the world, as far as I understood. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Alberto, Alex, and Kishore for inviting me to, to, co to contribute to this uh, very interesting workshop. Um, the topic that I picked for my presentation today is about the performance monitoring. Uh, this is not a new topic in education topic in the framework of performance engineering. Uh, nevertheless, uh, um, I believe that this topic deserves a lot of uh, importance, a lot of interest nowadays because of the pervasiveness of um, uh, technologies in our daily, daily lives. Uh, so the, um, what we will, uh, I will discuss during the presentation are, is a, a set of uh, recommendations and guidelines that, that my colleagues, uh, Luisa and Daniela and myself, uh, have derived over the years by teaching both graduate and undergraduate classes. So here is the... Let me see. Okay, here the, the outline of my presentation. I will briefly introduce some concepts uh, on performance monitoring, and then I will present the methodological approach that we typically apply for for teaching this uh, this type of content uh, and uh, practical application uh, in the framework of a computer networks class, not performance engineering by itself. Uh, and finally, I will draw some conclusion and I will uh, and uh, some further recommendations of, uh, of uh, the teaching aspects of this topic. So let's start by some introductory concepts on performance monitoring. Uh, so monitoring is the process of uh, collecting measurements. Uh, it's a, a key activity uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the framework of performance engineering, but it is a very important and very relevant activity in many other uh, application domains, including, for example, security, including uh, healthcare, um, uh, agriculture, and many others. Uh, why is that? Because um, the data that are being collected are uh, usually of interest of, uh, of many stakeholders, for example, from uh, starting from end users, uh, software developers, uh, operators, providers, and so on. Um, and uh, these uh, stakeholders often base uh, their choices and their decisions on, uh, on the measurements being collected. So this means that uh, it is necessary uh, to uh, build uh, confidence and to monitor the entire monitoring process in order to, to have accurate measurements to, um, to use. Uh, and the, I th we think that the, the best way to start to, to, um, to meet these uh, objectives, so this goal to build confidence in the entire monitoring process, is to teach students. So students should be the, the vehicle for, for uh, teaching this, this type of content. So uh, why teaching a performance monitoring? Um, first of all, uh, 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 this slide shows a list of uh, possible reasons uh, why performance monitoring uh, is important. Um, so this, uh, this uh, reason should, uh, should convince us that performance monitoring is something that uh, is very important uh, for, uh, for, uh, to learn by, by students. Um, and so this, uh, this means that uh, uh, we believe that the performance monitoring skills and competencies uh, should be a must have for every computer science student and also for students uh, uh, that uh, are specialized in a computing related field, not just computer science, but for a broader, um, um, uh, for, from a, for a broader audience. 
Uh, so let's now uh, think about, uh, about uh, talk about the monitoring project. Uh, the monitoring project uh, requires a specific methodology. So we need to plan, to design, and to set up uh, the project. And for this purpose, we need to define a appropriate methodological approach. So we cannot do things random; otherwise, the result will be di a disaster. Uh, so we want to um, to collect uh, measurements that uh, have good quality. And so for this uh, um, uh, objective, we need to to, uh, to define a very uh, um, precise methodological approach. Um, in particular, uh, we also uh, need uh, to um, specify some uh, prerequisites uh, that we have. Uh, so the, um, they, they are, these two prerequisites uh, are subdivided in two categories. First of all, the, do the domain knowledge. So before starting any monitoring project, uh, it's necessary to have uh, uh, a very solid uh, domain knowledge in order to be able to assess what the measurements uh, uh, will tell us. Uh, and of course, it is also necessary to have a deep understanding of the entire monitoring project process. Uh, so um, what about what is the methodological approach that, that we typically apply when we teach this uh, kind of topic? Uh, the, the approach consists of uh, multiple interdependent steps um, that are formulated in terms of questions, and each question refers to a specific aspect of the project itself. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves is uh, why? So why do we monitor? So we have to ask ourselves why we are setting up a, a, mon a monitoring project. So what are the objectives of our project? And these objectives uh, must be uh, uh, defined in clear terms uh, in order to, because they, they will drive and they will influence all the choices that we will make in the, in the uh, following steps. So this is uh, the, 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 this first First uh, step is uh, uh, for us is very important because it uh, uh, it uh, provides uh, the overview of the entire monitoring project. Then uh, we need to define uh, what is our target, so which who, so the component that we are going to monitor, and uh, the um, uh, properties uh, of the of the target that we want to measure. So in terms of uh, uh, quantitative and uh, qualitative attributes that we want to measure about the target. Uh, of course, we also need to define uh, the um, vantage point, uh, so the, where, where uh, we are going to take the measurements, uh, so the location where the measurements uh, will be uh, collected. Finally, uh, the mon mon measurement process. So how do we measure? How do we collect measurements? So we have to answer uh, uh, these questions by uh, uh, identifying uh, the techniques and tools that uh, should be applied for collecting this measurement. So this, uh, as, uh, as you can see, is a brief uh, uh, summary of the whole the question that we have to ask ourselves uh, in order to uh, set up a sound and, and effective monitoring project. Of course, uh, this is not yet uh, uh, all because uh, once the measurements have been collected, we, it is also necessary to summarize and to analyze, to analyze and summarize these measurements and in order to, to get models and to that uh, describe the properties uh, and the behavior uh, of the target. So now let's see a practical application of this uh, of this approach. I, I, it's uh, it's just a sketch of what uh, we are doing during our classes, uh, and uh, as I said, it, it, it is not uh, an exhaustive application because of the, uh, in the fifteen minutes uh, we ju uh, I could uh, just uh, do a, big, a, big, a little sketch. Uh, we picked uh, a class on computer networks, okay, and our objectives um, as uh, instructor as teachers. Uh, was uh, to uh, add the, to give students the possibility to uh, understand in practice the behavior uh, between uh, uh, the behavior so of uh, the Internet Protocol stack. So in a, in a sense, we are mining the gap, as Alberto said, between theory and practice. Okay, so the idea is to see in practice how uh, the protocols work. Okay, how the protocols work in terms of uh, uh, features and ter in terms of uh, characteristics. And so this is what the, uh, this is our objective. Um, the, so the idea is uh, to set up a, a specific monitoring project uh, that takes into account the various aspects that I discussed. So the various steps that I discussed earlier. So um, uh, as objectives, uh, we could assess. Uh, um, we could uh, put uh, two different objectives. Number one could be uh, to check the health of the uh, communication infrastructure, and at the same time uh, to discover uh, the network topology. 
the target, our target in this case was the SPEC website. So since uh, SPEC is one of the sponsors, uh, uh, sponsor of this conference. Uh, so um, the SPEC website was uh, our target and uh, we will uh, collect measurements from a machine or, or located at our university. Uh, and uh, the, in, in, uh, spe in specific terms, so we are interested in uh, understanding how far the target is from us, uh, as well as how long it takes uh, to reach uh, the target. Uh, in terms of techniques and tools, students will learn uh, various types of techniques and tools. In particular, they will learn uh, active uh, techniques uh, that will be used uh, to um, uh, generate artificial traffic, so uh, uh, generate packets uh, toward the, uh, the tar from the vantage point uh, toward the target. And in this case, as a tool, uh, we picked uh, something very simple, uh, that is uh, the trace route command. Um, uh, in, in parallel with the um, with these uh, active uh, techniques, we also um, implement some passive uh, techniques, and in particular, we are interested in uh, understanding and uh, and the eavesdropping uh, the traffic that is flowing uh, inside the network. And so, in this case, uh, we uh, you will use uh, a tool that, in, in specific in the specific case, is Wireshark, uh, that will allow us uh, to eavesdrop it and to see all the traffic that uh, will be ge generated by. The trace of command. So this is the scenario that we are we are going to analyze. So we have, we have a machine here in Italy, uh, and uh, we have the server hosting the spec website uh, in the United States. And between us, okay, between the, these two machines, uh, there is internet in between. So uh, the experiment, so if we look at the uh, trace route scenario, uh, we have uh, something like this, again, the same scenario as before. Uh, we have uh, the vantage point, uh, that is uh, uh, sending uh, multiple sequences or multiple packets. I will not go into the details how the trace route works, but just, just to give you a flavor of what's going on. So there will be a traffic, artificial traffic that is generated from uh, the machine at our university um, toward uh, the, the target that is uh, this server down here. And uh, the, what will happen? Uh, some packets will eventually reach uh, the target, of course, uh, and uh, the, there will be responses from the various packets that will be uh, um, received by, by the vantage point. And so the vantage point from these responses will be able to understand uh, the topology of the network, so how, uh, how many hops and how the, the various uh, components are linked together, uh, as well as the delays between the various, uh, the various uh, um, uh, routers and the various endpoints. So this is the uh, trace route scenario. Um, so we, I, I present briefly some, some uh, results that we can uh, show stu uh, students. The first experiment, so where we combine uh, the sniffer with the trace route command, um, uh, provide, this is a, a, an example of the output that we can have from uh, the sniffer from Wireshark, uh, where we have uh, the, the sequence of packets that have been sent up from uh, our uh, machine at the university uh, toward the, the uh, server hosting the SPAC website. Okay, and in particular, in this case, we should point out uh, the, uh, to the students the behavior of the IP protocol and the behavior of the uh, mechanism that is the time to leave uh, that measures uh, the maximum number of hops that the packet can travel inside the net. Uh, another uh, another uh, chart that uh, that can be shown and another other details that can be shown uh, refers to the to the uh, responses that uh, are received by by the vantage point for, um, and in this case uh, we could uh, explore uh, the behavior of the ICMP protocol and in particular the behavior of the uh, of a specific type of message that is uh, time to leave exceeded message so this is again a, just a, a flavor of what's going on. Uh, if you look at the details of uh, the race route command, so this is something very complex uh, for, uh, for a presentation because there are a lot of names, numbers, and IP addresses, but I, I just want to show you something. So in this case, uh, we will have the various hops that the various packets uh, um, uh, tra uh, travel to get to the destination. They didn't actually reach uh, the destination because we have these uh, stars that represent that, uh, the, the fact that the, 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 the path is blocked. But uh, apart than that, uh, we have uh, for each uh, uh, for each um, uh, hop we have uh, the uh, IP address and the name of the router that is uh, that given up away from us. Uh, but uh, we can also identify some anomalies over here. 
for example, in, if you look at, look at the OP12, okay, uh, we have uh, two different routers, okay, that uh, replies from OP number 12. Okay, uh, so this means that uh, we have some, we might have some problems in the network. Um, if we look at the times, so the delays, uh, we, we see that uh, the, the times tend to increase as the number of ops increases because we are the, the packet is is, uh, is traveling farther and farther. Uh, so, for example, uh, if we are, if we look at this time at uh, op eleven, we have uh, that uh, the time that is about forty six milliseconds. Uh, if you look at the op twelve, okay, we have that the time is under and seventeen uh, milliseconds. So this means that uh, the, there is the times uh, is almost double. Uh, this means that uh, the, um, there will be a delay uh, and the packet uh, uh, cross the Atlantic, uh, reach the other side of the Atlantic. And so they, there is the delay that is due to the satellite link uh, that is, uh, is uh, between uh, the, the two sides of the Atlantic. But uh, as you can see, and so in this case, it is something that a student could learn about the delays of the packets that tra are traveling far farther. Uh, but in this case, we have another anomaly uh, because one of the three packets that are, are associated with the uh, HOP12 has a delay of 50 milliseconds. So this means that the, one of the packets was not able to cross the Atlantic and so stayed, still stayed in Europe. And so this anomaly uh, needs, of course, further investigations and to see uh, what, is, uh, what, what is actually happening. Um, we have another example uh, where, where instead of using uh, UDP, we are using TCP. Okay, uh, and even in this case, we uh, we have uh, the, in this case we have the, the, uh, the we are able to to reach spec uh, to reach the, the target. Okay, so at, uh, at um, after fifteen ops, uh, the, uh, our packets uh, could reach the target. But uh, we could we could also uh, show uh, some. Oops, sorry. I push the, the wrong button. Button. Uh, we could also show some anomalies. Uh, we could also out, outline some anomalies. Uh, if you look at, for example, at uh, at uh, op nine and op ten, uh, the routers that are uh, at op nine and op ten are exactly the same. So this means that there is something wrong in the network. And again, uh, if we look at op eleven and op twelve. Uh, we have a, a router that is uh, is uh, 11 ops from us, and it, it is also at 12 ops from us. So this means that there is some there might be some problems or some anomalies uh, in the traffic. So what are the lessons learned by the students? For sure, they 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 uh, learn uh, how the protocols behave. So they learn in practice all the concepts that were taught in theory. And so this was very beneficial for them because they, they could see how the protocols actually behave. And they also um, uh, understood the, the limitations uh, that could affect the accuracy of the measurements because um, the quality of measurements, uh, as we said at the beginning, are, is very important. So it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's important for them to, to understand what, uh, what are the, 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 uh, the limitations that that could affect the tools that we are using or the, the limitation that are, are um, uh, intrinsic in the network uh, structure in the network uh, um, uh, configuration or, or, or in the on, in the particular uh, time when the, the measurement were taken so we show uh, we have seen that there were blocked path and there was also an unstable path that uh, that uh, the where, where we have uh, the same routers uh, that uh, re responds to the packet from different uh, uh, distance from us and so this uh, is, uh, will also um, um, this uh, will be um, uh, a proof that it is necessary uh, to repeat the experiments uh, multiple times in order to ensure the quality of the measurements uh, and uh, possibly to discard measurements uh, that are affected by problems. Another problem, another issue that uh, we want to address in, and we should address to, to students is uh, are the privacy and ethical issues associated with the, uh, the usage of sniffers. Okay, uh, because uh, by using sniffer, uh, we could expose uh, personally, personally identifiable data. And we know that uh, right now, uh, many countries have uh, specific regulations, like in Europe, we have the GDPR, California has uh, the CCDP, uh, uh, Brazil has another, Singapore has another, and so on and so forth. And so in this case, we should, uh, we could, uh, we should outline uh, the uh, responsibilities and uh, 
uh, of uh, using sniffers uh, be, uh, and to uh, possibly uh, disclose, let's say, or expose uh, personal identifiable data without the explicit consent uh, of the users. So this is basically a summary of the lesson learned. So to conclude, uh, we believe that performance monitoring uh, is a very important uh, field in performance engineering. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it, since uh, the domain knowledge is an, an important aspect inside of this, uh, these uh, experiments, um, it should be taught uh, more extensively, uh, especially inside uh, not uh, in, uh, in performance engineering courses by, itself, by themselves, but in, in uh, more general courses. So we think that courses like computer networks, uh, uh, software engineering, uh, uh, computer security, um, uh, courses like this will benefit a lot from uh, uh, teaching performance uh, uh, monitoring. Um, and so the, this uh, principle and practice should be taught and applied more extensively. In fact, what we see in general is that whenever we teach this, uh, this methodological approach and we never, whenever we have students uh, applying in practice, this, this concept, they are uh, usually very enthusiastic. So they learn much faster, and so they 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 will the learning experience of the student will be uh, improved very much. That's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was a very nice presentation. Any quick questions? We are a little bit behind time now. I guess our delays are going to be increasing. It's appropriate Sorry. for our performance model. <laughs> so, or should we keep the discussions to the end? Or maybe like there was a recommendation to put out the long leave conversations on Slack. I think it's a good idea. Thanks Dave for that suggestion. I have one very quick question, which is probably covered in the paper. Uh, Maria, did you um, did you use open source measuring tools or commercial ones? Uh, open source. Great. So we we use uh, tools that are either part of the operating system because I, I, I mentioned the example of uh, uh, of the net computer networks, but uh, we have also experiments uh, that we have been doing, uh, for example, inside the uh, courses of operating systems, where we use, uh, for example, the performance counter that are provided by, by Linux, so the uh, Linux performance counters, or we provide, uh, we use uh, other tools that are generally open source. Mm -hmm. Never use uh, proprietary tools, especially because universities are in general poor, and so they don't have uh, money to afford uh, buying uh, expensive tools. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So next uh, talk is by Andre Bondi and his team. Can you share, Andre? Thank you. Okay, I will go into projection mode here. And uh, I'm very glad that my talk followed Maria's because it sets the stage very nicely for mine. And uh, having heard hers, we'll see that they're glaring omissions from what we try to do at Stevens. But we were somewhat constrained by the nature of the course as well. Uh, rather than uh, teaching a self-contained performance course, which is not yet part of the curriculum at Stevens, much as I would like it to be, uh, we grafted one or two lectures on performance, performance measurement and performance testing onto a course on functional testing. So functional testing is the principal subject. Uh, the students learn to build test plans based on functional requirements and scenarios and use cases. And uh, then they did some practical work using Python libraries to develop test harnesses and use assertions to validate the functionality of the programs. So uh, we tried to build on that in order to teach elementary performance testing by using workload scenarios, performance requirements, and uh, basic performance modeling to build performance test plans and performance test cases. But we wanted them to have some hands-on measurement experience as well. And with the limited, of limited time we had, we were sim somewhat limited about what we could do. I also wanted, we also wanted to make it fun for them. Uh, we're trying to link performance testing to rudimentary performance models and measurements. So basically the utilization law and not very much else. And uh, for the reasons that Maria mentioned, because universities are poor and because we didn't have a lab set up, 
uh, we only did experiments with resource usage measurements on the students' own laptops. And for that, we used uh, the Windows Task Manager for those who had PC, PC Windows systems and uh, the Apple Activity Manager for those who are using Apple-based systems. And by the way, uh, I had done something similar in L'Aquila when I was a visiting professor there four years ago. In fact, I used, I used some, of the same, some of the same assignments. And my colleague Grazia, uh, with whom this is joint work, uh, is expert in JMeter. So she put together exercises for the students to practice response time measurement of websites and so on. Uh, the problem that we had there is that we couldn't measure server side because we didn't own the websites. And we'll see a bit later on that there were some eth ethical issues that we ran into as well. So I've already given you a flavor for the testing course at Stevens. Uh, I want to set the context for performance testing, which is what we had to do with the students, because most of them are taking software engineering for the first time. Many of them didn't even have a computer science background. Some of them might have been double E's. Uh, the concept of experimental design and measurement will be somewhat alien to them. But uh, we tried to give them something to play with also so that they could see that performance measurement actually gives them some insight about how a system actually works and what it's doing. And we'll see that this ties back to the protocol measurement that uh, Maria described in, in her talk as well. So um, we're trying to cover software, the title of the course is software testing, quality and maintenance. And uh, the goal is to teach the students how to achieve the most suitable test strategy with the highest possible test coverage. We obviously can't do that in performance testing with the limited time that we had available. But they're doing extensive hands-on work with uh, technical investigation of a product to determine system quality. And also we teach them how to communicate uh, test results to other stakeholders. Uh, this course is usually in the second semester of their stay for master's programs. Uh, the emphasis is not really on training researchers in this course. Uh, and we were teaching them resource usage measurement and performance requirements and basic modeling uh, in the, uh, in the uh, performance part of the course. And that provided an opportunity to bring modeling concepts to life and show that they how can show how they can predict uh, system behavior using the models. And then we showed them how to design the tests uh, so that the performance tests that is so that uh, they could predict uh, linearity of utilization with respect to the arrival rate, for example. Uh, we didn't actually give them a chance to do that, but uh, my book is actually online in the Stevens Library, so they could actually go and look up what I was talking about and do some reading without going to the expense of buying anything. So to set the performance context, uh, we wanted to give the students a brief overview of how performance engineering fits into the software development life cycle. Bear in mind that many of them don't even have an operating system background. So, but we do have the chance to explain to them that we want to do performance testing on use cases that have already passed functional testing. Now, of course, uh, the functional testing is unit testing, so it's not going to expose concurrency problems. And we try and explain to them that uh, performance tests may actually expose concurrency problems as well, like deadlock and uh, violations of indivisibility and mutual exclusion and so on, and how this can lead to uh, nasty occurrence of errors and things like that. We introduce them to utilization law and Little's law and describe how performance measurements tell us something about the system and how they can use that to validate the measurements and the instrumentation. And because they've already heard about test plans and test cases and functional requirements, getting across the notion of performance requirements is relatively straightforward. We just have to graph the quantitative concepts onto that. Not a trivial task actually, but at least the groundwork is there. Uh, and I've already mentioned uh, the concurrency issues. We didn't have an entire student, a system that students could test, but we could at least give a flavor for measurement. And that was, that was our main goal, really. So we gave them two kinds of exercises, resource usage on a laptop uh, using Win Windows Perfmon, which is what I'm going to describe because that's what I use. 
and um, uh, some J meter testing, which it turned out posed some ethical problems that we could, we should actually gather the ethical problems in our workshop report with, with Maria's because we're going, we're running into some, we're running into different problems, but related. Um, the application that I used was streaming of an opera excerpt with and without video because YouTube is there and the instrumentation is there on their system. So I wanted to observe, I wanted them to observe the differences in bandwidth when they're actually running uh, a full blown opera. We use the triumphal march from Verdi's Aida and uh, we used a fully staged version with a moving chorus and orchestra uh even elephants elephants on the stage and a wind band without chorus no video exactly the same piece of music so that is as close as we could get to a controlled experiment without doing a lot of work and uh this worked this worked out at l'aquila quite well uh also it's interesting for them to look at the bandwidth usage patterns i've shown here the uh, network usage on a laptop. The left-hand screen is uh, the marching band only. And one needs to look at the vertical scale up here. You get humps and that's revealing because that tells us that we're doing a lot of prefetching and not much GPU activity because there wasn't much, there wasn't much GPU, go, there wasn't much video activity going on. Uh, there's some caching going on as you start up. So where you start the experiment, where, you, where, where I actually take these snapshots is really important because there's an initial ramp up when you get started. And uh, I may have taken these measurements at different times, which is why you don't have a lot of CPU activity going on here. Uh, and yet we're showing 15% usage and here, we're showing 10% usage at a lower range, but more GPU activity because there's a lot more vision. So what's happening here is that there's a lot of these with these network humps, the students can surmise that the that a lot of the video stream is being downloaded and prefetched. So what you see is a continuous performance. And in Italy, we actually it being Italy, I had the students run run video of the World Cup between France between France and Italy that was run in Munich in 2006 and the ball goes into the net and you don't see anything because it's the the video just shows the deltas but the other thing that's complementary to what Maria was talking about these small lines here are the outbound traffic and this is the inbound traffic okay so this set is basically saying give me some more and acknowledgement I have it I think YouTube was using TCP IP at that time to do the streaming. But we didn't use a sniffer, so we don't really know. That's that's something that we would want to do if we were grafting this onto Maria's course. Okay. So these points uh, I have these points I have basically described here. The receive bandwidth is much higher with video than without. Uh, the send bandwidth is tiny compared with the receive bandwidth in, in both cases. If the students have studied protocols, then we want them to dig into that. Uh, my students at Stevens had not. My students at L'Aquila probably had. Uh, the GPU uses a lot more with video than without, which is not surprising. And we want the students to explain why this is so. And we want the students to explain why they have these bandwidth humps, at least in terms of their practical experience if they don't necessarily understand how the video streaming is working. Okay, turning now to the part that uh, Razier worked on, uh, she had the students write JMeter scripts and uh, they were actually, they could, we had them test any old site that they wanted, but that actually brings us to the ethical problems because you shouldn't really be subjecting a website that you don't own to uh, a lot of load. You might want to ping just to see, you, you do a few transactions here and there, just to see what the response time is like, but you don't want to subject it to load. Uh, you only want to subject a university owned website uh, to that, to that kind of thing. And that, that'll bring us to the ethical problem that uh, I'm going to describe a little bit later on. So here, here we have a scenario with a hundred virtual users and the test completed. Uh, you have a rapid ascent of throughput. Uh, the colors on the slide correspond to the colors on the plot. You have a quick narrowing of deviation of response time and a plateauing of the average response time. 
we didn't have the privilege of measuring server side, so we couldn't really see what was going on. I would have liked to have done that. Uh, with 500 users and a longer ramp up, you have a steep ascent of the transaction throughput. You actually ran out of memory on the load driver. That's an interesting lesson for them to learn. I would say that the load driver is itself a computer. Uh, that's their laptop and we should actually have them doing the same kind of measurements that I showed you for the YouTube application so they can see the effect of that the load, load generator is going to have on the resource utilization load generator side. That's really critical. You don't want to, you don't, you, you don't want to be generating load faster than you can actually do it. It should not be part of the test plan. And it is, you need, if it is, you need more load generators and that's something else that they can learn as well. So this crash actually provided a valuable object lesson for them, I think. Okay, uh, so with the Windows Task Manager, we are in fact seeing 100% utilization for loads of more than 500 virtual users. That of course depends on the hardware configuration on your laptop. Um, scenario three was completed before the class, in, but in, in front of the class, but it failed in before class, but it failed in class. And one reason might be that all the students in attendance ran load tests simultaneously. And uh, a load test of 45,000 requests per second, which is an awful lot, uh, really uh, was throwing more load at the system under test than we should have been throwing. And this, by the way, allows me to throw in an anecdote, which is not on the slides. Uh, and that is that um, when I was in L'Aquila, I observed a class in software engineering in which all the students downloaded Eclipse at the same time. And it was really, really slow. And they were all sitting in the classroom together. So the question I asked the students in L'Aquila who are sitting in my, who are taking our performance lecture was, what kind of policy should we have had in class to present, to prevent the problems? And it could have been, the first row to all downloads together, then the second row of students in the classroom download together and so on. Or maybe we should have the teachers give advance warning of this beforehand and have the students do it at home. So, uh, but coming to turning to the ethical concerns, uh, we shouldn't subject a system that you don't own or host to intensive performance testing without the site owner's permission. And actually that's in the terms of service of LinkedIn and Google and, uh, Amazon and various others, I think, uh, you don't want to be interfering with the site owner's mission or business objectives, however noble and objective teaching is. And the, something that Alex Padelko pointed out to me was that the site owner bears the cost of ret retrieving content from a content delivery network. And we shouldn't be subjecting the site owner to that maybe a little bit is okay, but otherwise really not if you have 50 students sitting in a class. So, and the other problem is that the site owner might interpret testing activity as a denial of service attack. And that could get the students into trouble. And many of our students at Stevens are from, over, from abroad and we don't want them getting into trouble, especially. Um, uh, and then uh, the site owners may prevent users from generating automated traffic without express permission. So we can't use that as a target. And by the way, we stumbled on this because one of my students had actually crashed a friend's website, which was hosted on GoDaddy or something like that while he was completing the homework assignment. So there was an object lesson there. And um, uh, when this course was taught by a colleague uh, this past semester, um, uh, the students actually pointed out to the professor that there were certain things she was asking them to do that they really shouldn't be doing. So it, it goes both ways. So what are the recommendations here? Um, I heartily concur with everything Maria said. Uh, if you're going to graph this onto uh, test and on functional testing, um, I recommend devoting at least six hours to performance modeling, performance requirements, and testing. That does not address the role of architecture and performance engineering, but allows better connection between the other aspects of software engineering, like functional testing and so on. And here, um, uh, some of these recommendations I actually owe to the referees. Uh, we want to deploy, we should deploy an open test website and a university owned lab such as SockShot or TrainTicket. 
and that allows the measurement of server side usage and response time so we can have the students understand the consequences of the load that's being applied and allow modifications of the configurations in the lab to see the impact on performance. That requires a great deal of preparation and supervision on the part of the teachers and scheduling of lab time and so on. Uh, but all in all, we should be targeting university-owned pages. Even if we can't measure the university pages, we can at least work with the IT department in order to let them know that this, this is going to happen. So what have we achieved here? Um, we've shown the students that performance test plans should be driven by performance requirements, just the way functional test plans are driven by functional requirements or stories if you're working in an agile framework. Uh, we wanted to give the students a flavor of resource usage and response time measurement. Uh, and we introduced them to the concept of a nearly controlled experiment uh, by showing them this opera excerpt with and without video and uh, also giving them the concept of gaining insight into what an application is doing by measuring its resource usage patterns. We would have liked more time to explain how performance testing relates to performance modeling and prediction. We just didn't have that. It wasn't the main part of the syllabus, but we, we, we at least wanted to show how this can be used to influence performance test design. And we introduced students to the concepts of representative and uh, stressful workloads. And we also need to understand and have the students, and there's a typo in the slide, that principles matter more than tools. Actually, principles, ethical principles as well matter. matter. Uh, just as we shouldn't be looking inside uh, with the packets with a sniffer, we shouldn't be throwing a lot of load at, uh, test, at, test, at, at uh, sites that we don't own in order to see what the response time really is. We should look at response times of websites we don't own in the context of the, the workload that they're already carrying. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's very I'm nice going to stop talk. sharing to clear the decks. Thank you. Any questions? Any discussions? Uh, yes, I have a quick question. Thank you very much for the nice presentation, Andre. So uh, maybe it's a question for later in the discussion, I guess, but uh, I wanted to state it anyway. It's about the exam formats possible for these kind of courses. I find it sometimes challenging to test, you know, when you have so many practical things and uh, you can put some theoretical questions, but it's really challenging unless you have more time, of course, to invest per student. So very quickly, did you have exam in this course and how did you do it? Written, uh, in, oral, uh, combined? Okay, first of all, we, we ran this for the first, this way for the first time during the pandemic, which means that having a proctored exam wasn't possible. Uh, this, these two exercises were part of a take home project at Stevens. Mm -hmm. uh, if, and at L'Aquila, it was also a take home project. I think Vittorio gave oral exams on the performance principles, but he was teaching a performance course. Is that right, Vittorio? Yeah, it's right. Yeah. In the oral part, we were doing some uh, oral examples. Right, right. And that's the way I'd be inclined to do it, actually, because then you can interview the student to see mm -hmm. how. Uh, the student can come to come to grips with principles and grope in the dark about things that are not necessarily acquired by rote learning. So I would be inclined to do the practical stuff as an oral exam and do the, do the theoretical stuff uh, as, a, as a written exam. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we are getting delayed like uh, five minutes per talk. That's our <laughs> monitoring <laughs> result now. So which, which is fine, we had some, some slack in the end for that. So that's okay. So, Christina, thank you. We are next. Yes, thank you. Let me share, share my presentation. Yeah. So, are you sharing your presentation? I am sharing it right now. Okay. Uh, okay. Looks yes. Good. So, looks good. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. This is joint work uh, with Alex Yusuf from BU Amsterdam and my students Edwin Bosa and Eduardo Ortiz. So what we did in our, in our paper for our study was an analysis of distributed systems syllabi with a focus on performance related topics. 
And I think this fits in very, very well with what we've been seeing in the past presentations, because as we all know, we can talk about performance uh, in computing curricula through standalone courses, but for several reasons, sometimes what we do is we add these topics to other courses like uh, parallel programming or computer organization. And um, in our study, what we did was we took a look at one of these courses, which is distributed systems. And we think distributed systems is particularly appropriate for performance topics because this course focuses on a holistic system view, which is needed for this kind of studies. And also uh, there's uh, at distributed systems, we have a diverse set of levels and components where performance can be considered uh, from the processor level to uh, things like storage and sensors or from uh, small scale to very large scales. Um, and also in these classes, we usually use examples of a broad range of performance aware applications, online gaming, video streaming, uh, HPC, et cetera. So what we wanted to do was to understand in a distributed system syllabi, to what extent are performance related topics being listed in the topic lists of this syllabi, which is what's available uh, for students before they take the course. And also we wanted to take a quick look at the academic papers that they are, they're referencing and whether or not these have a strong focus on performance. We use a data-driven analysis methodology in which we start from a previous, previously collected data set of recent distributed syllabi. And we ask specific research questions um, and try to answer them based on the data that we have from the data set. And for each research question in the paper, we have a detailed description of how we used to obtain the, uh, how we obtain the answer of that question. But it's typically we searched for one or more keywords related to what we wanted to ask, and sometimes had some exclusions for terms that uh, were actually being used in a different context. And uh, also for this analysis, what we did was we leveraged the domain knowledge and expertise of the first two authors. Uh, we because we've been teaching both distributed systems and performance topics with a combined experience of over 30 years. So a little bit about the data, which like I said, was uh, we collected previously for another study, which was published in uh, earlier this year in 60, 2021. And uh, the data set has, uh, we collected syllabi that were available online. So we didn't contact the professors. We, we worked with things that were already publicly available. And uh, we restricted ourselves to the top 100 uh, ranked program in the Times Higher Education Computer Science 2019 ranking. We wanted to study recent syllabi. So we uh, only collected syllabi that were from 2019 and 2020 uh, at the time when we did the study. And um, as a result, we selected 51 likely high quality current syllabi that focuses strongly on distributed systems, which was manually curated to obtain information, specific information like the rank, the name of the university, country, course name, instructor, course code here, links, topic list, which is the one that we analyzed uh, in most detail for this study, textbook, um, other recommended books, and for papers, we did the same thing, list of required papers and list of uh, papers that were listed as recommended readings. Okay, so um, the specific research questions that we looked into where we had four research questions related to specific uh, keywords, whether or not they appear on the topic lists and related words, uh, terms. Uh, we looked into performance, scale, scalability, elasticity, performance evaluation or benchmarking and performance monitoring. Uh, also, we looked at techniques that are uh, used to enhance performance and whether or not these appear listed in the syllabi. Um, research question six, uh, for that we looked at the infrastructure years in the distributed systems courses because some focus may focus more on a smaller scale like uh, only client server, whereas other may have a strong focus on internet, internet scale uh, massively distributed systems. Um, also, we looked at which control aspects appear in the distributed systems topic lists and uh, about the, the reading material, academic papers, which of them, uh, how many of them, and which 
specific ones mention performance or scale in their title. So I'll go through the main findings for each of the research questions. So for as main finding one, we found that 14% of the distributed systems courses in our data set uh, specifically mentioned performance in the topic list. So I would say that's only 14% do this. 24% um, do mention scale, which is, as we know, very much related. Um, and uh, we found surprising that none of them actually in the topic lists uh, discuss issues or mention issues related to benchmarking or evaluation of distributed systems. Uh, and also a small fraction, specifically 6% of the topic lists mention monitoring. Um, about the performance enhancing techniques, uh, we've, we've uh, selected a, uh, some techniques and we search for them in the topic list to see if they were mentioned. And we find that three fourths of the performance enhancing techniques that we uh, looked for appear frequently. Specifically, and from more frequent to least frequent, we found replication is the most frequent one with 60, uh, mentioning 61% of the, the syllabi in the, the data set, followed by streaming in 27% and caching in 18%. Also somewhat popular are scheduling, sharding, and load balancing. Uh, the other two techniques that we looked for weren't popular. Uh, migrating was only uh, mentioned in 2% of the topic lists and uh, uploading was mentioned in zero of the topic list, none of them mentioning. About the scale, we looked at different terms that the, uh, kind of the, let us understand the scale that the distributed systems are being studied. And the, most, the terms that appear most, uh, most commonly are cloud computing in 29% of the syllabi, internet scale uh, with almost the same popularity, 27%, and followed by peer-to-peer -peer in 22% no other scale that we looked for appears above 8% in the topic lists. I mean, of course, like something like client server is going to be mentioned in most likely most or all distributed systems courses, but it doesn't appear listed in the topic lists. Um, about controlling performance issues, overall, we found that there are few references to these. Um, stability and variability do not appear in the topic lists. The word trade-off or the term trade-off does appear in 6% of the topic list. Usually when discussing things, uh, the trade-off between consistency and latency or, or consistency and availability in, in, in systems that have distributed, shared distributed data. And about the academic papers that are being referenced in this syllabi, uh, we found that um, eight different uh, papers explicitly mentioned performance in the title and 34 uh, of the papers that are in the, in the reading lists uh, explicitly mention scalability or the variance of this word in the title. In the slide, what you can see is the ones that mention the, the eight instances of the word performance in the, in the reading lists. So uh, based on this uh, data-driven analysis that we did, we issued some recommendations that are better explained in the paper if this is something you're interested in. Uh, but I'll, I'll briefly discuss them. We think um, it is important to include more explicit performance topic in the distributed systems curriculum. This shouldn't be an afterthought or a second class citizens. Students should know that it is a very important thing and you cannot actually think about distributed systems without thinking about their performance and how, how, where, how they'll behave when um, they receive more requests. We think um, we should focus more on performance and scale as first class concepts. And uh, about system evaluation and benchmarking, we should add learning goals focusing uh, on the experimental evaluation of distributed systems. We should also consider including monitoring in the syllabi, which was completely lacking. Uh, I, I think this is usually discussed more in the context of software engineering, but distributed systems with their complexity of current cloud computing uh, systems. It, it's a very good place to actually uh, drive the message home to students of the importance of monitoring uh, distributed systems. And uh, the last recommendation is to increase the coverage of performance enhancing techniques used in practice under trade-offs and, and, and explicitly mention them in the syllabi. So uh, 
that is all. Thank you very much. I would like to take your questions or and also you can contact me to your uh, to my email address. And um, also, I wanted to tell you not to miss Hot Cloud Perf tomorrow, where we, we have a, a great uh, a great program of topics related to performance in cloud computing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Any questions? Discussions? So we can uh, move to next uh, presentation. Okay, I'll stop sharing. And the next one is uh, Sam. You can share. Just a second. Are you seeing the wrong view? Okay, so thank you very much for the to the organizers, of course, for this opportunity to present here. Uh, I have tried to summarize basically in a short slide set a course we have been working on since very long time. I don't even remember when it started. It has been a long-term project and now we completed it last year actually with, with a book that we wrote that summarized everything. So this is the summary of this long-term effort. Uh, it's about benchmarking or systems benchmarking and of course related to performance engineering as a major part of it. And uh, I start with a definition here. We use a broader definition of benchmarking. So at the top you see here the classical performance focus definition that spec is using or has been using for a long time. Our definition is much broader. It says basically that benchmarking is about evaluation and comparison of systems with respect to specific characteristics, which may be focused on performance, but may also be focused on other things like reliability, security, and so forth, availability, robustness. So it's much more broader. You can look at it in a way as performance in a broader sense. And uh, I want to give one example that, you know, measuring and evaluating systems, even with respect to a very easy thing like execution time might be challenging. So I give this example in my lecture all the time. It's basically a very simple one, but it cannot be more simple, yet it illustrates a point. And the example is we look at two different programs and their execution times on three different servers. And uh, if you measure and let's say you measure these values here and let's say they are repeatable, one approach could be you now take the average to compare these systems. I mean, in the formulation here, we say that the programs are equally important. So uh, since they're equally important, you might think, okay, average might not be very good because big numbers are given more weight. So why don't we take speed up? So one other approach to compare could be you take the speed up and compare with the first system and then you get this result. Basically the best one is this. Uh, and then the second the, and third place are the same basically. But now you might decide to do the same thing with taking the second server as a basis for comparison. So you end up in a different ranking or you might take the third server for comparison and you might end up in a different ranking. So I showed you here an example where you end up with completely different sorting and comparisons of these two, uh, these three servers based on using different metrics, right, for comparison. And this basically shows that even for very simple cases, benchmarking might become tricky because you don't always know what the best metric is that you pick in order to show something. Now, in this particular case, the solution is you take the geometric mean instead of the arithmetic mean, and then uh, the rankings are going to be consistent. Uh, but without going into detail, I wanted to basically say that, you know, benchmarking might easily be turned into bench marketing, and that's what we don't want it to be. <laughs> Really, that's also the reason that sometimes the reputation is a little bit questioned. I mean, some people seem to be using a wrong definition of benchmarking here that I don't support. Uh, but uh, there is this quote I really like from Dunkers. It says, it's easy to lie with statistics. 
it's hard to tell the truth without statistics, uh, which I think is the message we want to bring across here. It's not about, you know, finding all the issues with possible ways to manipulate and so forth. It's more about how do you do it right? How do you do benchmarking right in a fair, repeatable, reliable uh, manner? And that's what the goal is here. It's not only for industry, by the way, this goal. It's equally important for science. It's also in science that oftentimes benchmarks are used and experimental results are used. And the scientists even, you know, trying to reproduce their own work, you know, that they measured sometimes are challenged as shown in this article by Nature. So I'm not saying that, you know, all of these cases where unreliable results are presented are intentionally kind of trying to cheat or something. No, I think many of the cases, people just picked something and wrote it. They didn't intend to cheat or anything, but nonetheless, this does not mean that what they're doing is reproducible uh, in a scientific manner. So it's not only about, you know, industry and marketing and such things. It's also about science generally, because benchmarks are much widely used nowadays. So the course we built, it's centered around the book that we wrote, uh, in the last five years, I think, roughly, depending on when it counts, starting writing. And uh, it's a book that covers the foundations and applications of benchmarking. And it includes modern applications, case studies, and so forth. And we're working on materials. Now that we just managed finishing the books, now people are asking me about these materials. <laughs> it's like, oh God, it's like it never finishes. This project It's like open-ended. So I'm working now on the materials. It's hard for me to pick a deadline because I keep breaking it. So uh, I hope to provide the materials in the next months, at least initial version, and then next year, a more uh, comprehensive version. I want to give credit here to all the students in several universities where I have been teaching this course. I mean, it was actually a wider course, but included benchmarking so in the last uh, something like 15 years. And also for the writing of the book, it's not like myself and a couple of people wrote it. It's basically we incorporated input from many individuals, as you see here on the top, you see here a list of people that have been co-authors of some chapters in the second part of the book, the applications part. And here you see people that gave us feedback. They reviewed, you know, they gave us in, in, in intensive feed, feedback, including former spec presidents and such people with a lot of experience, experience in benchmarking. Uh, now the scope of benchmarking, the way we see it is much broader than the classical spec centered benchmarking. And this diagram from the book illustrates the scope. So if you look at a benchmarker, he's testing normally some system under test in a broader sense. It could be a hardware or software product. It could be an end-to-end -end application. This is open but he might have different intentions. He might be interesting to buy. In that particular case, he might compare for deciding what to buy or in order to size the system. He might also be in a completely different scenario. He wants to sell. So he might also want to show how good his products are performing or to certify the performance of their products. Um, he might be a developer or operator of some system interested in stress, regression testing, sizing, or capacity planning, or just optimization, tuning, or he might even use it as a blueprint, as an example application when developing his own uh, system. And last but not least, research, increasingly popular use of benchmarks in research as representative applications for evaluating research results like novel approaches to auto scaling or uh, performance isolation, similar things. Benchmarks are widely used in this area, also to enable fair comparisons. So what are the components of a benchmark? We need, on the one hand, reliable metrics. I showed in the beginning, it's not always easy, and we might easily end up in unreliable metrics. Uh, we need representative workloads, which tell us under what scenarios and what conditions measurements should be made. And we need a methodology, how everything is conducted. This is very important. Some people focus only on the first part or the second, but I think this methodology aspect is increasingly important, as was also shown in other presentations by previous speakers speaking about the methodological aspects of testing and performance evaluation. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about in detail about the quality criteria for benchmarks, but I'm sure many of you are well familiar with them. The relevance, the reproducibility, the fairness, the verifiability and usability are commonly stated as criteria. You might notice here that under reproducibility, we have a broader definition uh, that we're using. It's not only about repeatability. It's not only about being able to repeat the test. It's also about others being able to reproduce what you did. Did you give them enough information? Do you, are they able to reproduce your results, right? Independently of you, without having your own uh, environment. So this is a much more tricky reproducibility aspect. So in the final five minutes or so, I'm not sure how much I have, five minutes, I want to give you a very brief overview of the course itself, which follows the book. In the first part, we cover the foundations of uh, benchmarking, systems benchmarking, and uh, I'm going to briefly walk you through the major parts. We introduce the definitions like in a scientific textbook, we want to be very explicit about what is the difference between a metric, uh, a measure, measurement, all sorts of terms used in this space, uh, scales of measurements and so forth. Then introduce the types of benchmark, benchmarking strategies, the quality criteria I mentioned and application scenarios. After that, we introduce probability and statistics at the level required for this book. So it does not go into too much detail, not comparable to Kishore's books. They are much more in depth compared to this. So this is like walking through the main concepts to be able to understand the content of the book. And I cite Kishore's book for people interested to understand the real uh, deep mathematical foundations. It's one of the main, cit main citations I use for this. Then we have uh, metrics as a chapter here, focusing on the scales of measurements, the performance metrics, quality attributes for good metrics, and how you derive metrics from average values and so forth, composite metrics. That's a very important critical chapter. Statistical measurements has a lot of statistics uh, as the uh, name implies about the quantification of the precision of measurements, the repeatability of measurements, also how to compare alternatives. This is classical uh, topic in this area, which is a kind of subtopic of experimental design where a separate chapter focuses on building experiments and comparisons with M factor, full factorial designs or plucket Berman designs and so forth. Then there is a chapter on measurement techniques, which is a little bit more practical here, uh, talking about the challenges in measurement, for example, how do you measure very small intervals where the timer accuracy is not good enough to cover such intervals, right? Or how do you quantify the accuracy of your timer? You might have a timer, but you don't know how accurate it is. How can you evaluate this performance profiling, event tracing to build a model of the execution trace? These are all topics that are of practical relevance in benchmarking. Uh, since benchmarking is highly also related to queuing theory aspects, we have a chapter here on queuing theory, but it's very, very brief. It introduces mostly operational analysis based on measurement data, the common laws here that are widely accepted and introduces some basic queuing theory to enable some reasoning about the system. It's not a queuing theory book, so it's more like giving you enough for the context of benchmarking. Uh, and then we have a chapter on workloads, of course, covering the different types of workloads, how to build them, how to evaluate them, and so forth. There is a chapter on standardization. Every book on uh, benchmarking should cover standardization, of course. Here we focus on SPEC and PPC as two major standardization organizations. However, some others are also covered in this historical perspective in the beginning. And uh, yeah, this was also with input from former SPEC president and many other SPEC people involved. The second part of the book, I'm not going to walk through in detail, but just giving you the overview. It's about applications. And here is where the chapters have multiple authors, also from industry. 
uh, you saw this list of people I showed in the beginning. And uh, this has been iterated many times. It covers on the one hand CPU as a major benchmark in industry, but also uh, benchmarking energy efficiency, virtualization storage. And then it covers also some more uh, research oriented topics like evaluating performance isolation or elasticity of cloud platforms an activity in the cloud group, spec uh, research cloud group, also resource demand estimation and a little bit of security testing and evaluation in the, in the end. So as you can see, this is a mix of quite broad nature, showing how benchmarks are applied in practice. So this is, for lack of time, I could not present here more, but uh, I hope I gave you a, an overview. And as I mentioned, we are working on materials, including both questions for putting together exams, but also slides. I'm going to put my slides and provide them for teaching purposes and exercises for testing. Any questions? Thank you, Sam. Very nice. So let me stop question. sharing. I have time for a question. I have a question. Uh, Some time back, uh, I had a task at the Bell Labs to compare two very different hardware configurations, ability to run a very complex system. So that was a system with 16 holes database, all kinds of things, right? And we use a benchmarking approach there where we tune the benchmark to be a good performance uh, model of the system on the test. And then you run the benchmark on the two environments to see how how, how they compare to each other, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So that's what I'm wondering if this is something that has been capturing the standard benchmarks now, if, if there is a, a way to tune benchmarks to reproduce complex systems. Yes, so, it's a very, very hot topic in fact. And especially in one area currently very, very uh, picking up in popularity. Uh, if you notice now all these discussions about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all this, I don't want to call hype, whatever it is, wave, let's put it nicely, it's a wave, right? And in this area, a lot of data centric algorithms are used, which require data. And we all know, it was also mentioned in previous talks, how difficult it is to gather realistic, real life data. So what they're using now or, or people suggesting to use as an approach, in order to uh, facilitate gathering of data, you build actually a benchmark or you can look at it also as a model of the, of the type of system you're interested in. And then uh, uh, use this benchmark to kind of facilitate data generation. Mm -hmm. uh, modify it, maybe tweak it, and then generate many different cases where you can do measurements in the benchmark framework. So then you use the benchmark as a abstraction of the real life environment to simplify data gathering. Of course, it's a challenge to make it representative, but uh, that's uh, something I notice increasingly proposed nowadays, especially in, in the context of AI and data science related algorithms that require a lot of data and you might not be able to gather it. Mm -hmm. And you might have also privacy issues and all sorts of things that was mentioned earlier in other talks, right? In a benchmark, it's much easier because everything is somehow abstract, no uh, privacy problems or such things. So uh, for some systems, it might be a viable approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's... Uh go on to the next talk. Our next uh, presenter is David uh, Daly. Daly, you can take it from there and share. Thank I uh, honestly, I think I could spend at least half an hour, an hour responding to everybody's uh, talk so far. There's been a lot of great stuff in there. I'll, oh my word, it won't work. I have, Sam, I have your book um, and MongoDB has bought at least a few copies, but uh, it's, it's quite good, so thank you. Uh, let's hold up. Anyways, um, all right, let me share. I held up the wrong book. Funny, put it. Um, all right, so 
Uh, let me tell you a little bit of perspective from uh, my view at MongoDB. And uh, largely, I'll talk through uh, three things. Um, one is what we do at MongoDB around performance testing uh, and performance engineering. Uh, uh, two, my opinions of what I would like to see of people coming out of college that would make my life easier uh, in that role. Um, and then uh, some observations uh, related to it at the end. So we're largely doing performance testing. There's a lot of things that fall under performance engineering that where I sit at least, the big focus is on performance testing. Um, and what we're really trying to do is understand the performance of our software and when it changes. Uh, and when I say when, we have uh, a large number of developers who are constantly working on the next, uh, the next new feature, the next uh, performance optimization, the next bug fix. And they're constantly committing changes. And we want to know as those changes go into the server, into GitHub, what is the impact on performance for our customers? Uh, we want to, if it gets slower, if there's a performance regression, we want to detect it as quickly as possible, uh, ideally fix it and get it out of the uh, out of the code base as fast as possible. Uh, if we can't fix it, we at least want to understand it and mitigate it and let everybody know how to work around it uh, as best they can. Uh, and sometimes things get faster. And when they do, we want to know and we want to lock that in and we want to make sure that uh, our users can take full advantage of that improvement. Uh, so as part of that, uh, just a gratuitous uh, screenshot to throw in, we have lots and lots of graphs like this, which show sort of the performance over time. We actually have probably, um, we have about 3000 graphs like these uh, at a time when I uh, last checked. Um, but it's just showing the idea that we're measuring performance for a test over development time. For these graphs, higher is better. So sometimes things get worse. We want to detect that as fast as possible and fix it. Um, sometimes things get faster. We want to lock those in. Uh, we have lots of graphs like these. Uh, so we have a lot of people working on performance at MongoDB. Um, and there's at least four major roles. Um, we really want everybody working on performance, not just a side performance team or QA team. Um, we want everybody thinking about it. So we have all of the developers are responsible for performance. Um, we want everybody working on it. Uh, we have a team of build barons whose sole responsibility is looking at those graphs that I just showed. Actually, smarter stuff than those graphs, but basically those graphs. Um, we have an automated system that identifies when regressions, when performance changes. They look at those, they isolate things, they figure out what exact commit it went to, triage it, and assign it out to somebody to work on. Uh, and then we also, we have a very specialized performance team uh, that I'm a member of. And we get the harder things, right? So our, our true performance engineers should be on, on this team. And we try to get the more uh, holistic things, the, uh, the things that guiding the whole infrastructure and the issues that don't fit in any one, any one team's box. And finally, management touches performance all the time because when you're doing commercial software development, there's a constant prioritization going on. And so management needs to understand what the performance is to one, know, can we release this new software or not? And also, as things come up, what things do we want to invest the time in to fix and which things are less important and maybe, maybe we don't fix, maybe we accept, or maybe we just wait a little bit and uh, do if there's time later. Uh, and of course, that's a gross simplification. There's more groups than that, but uh, it's probably a useful way to think about it. Uh, and then from a testing perspective, we have six main use cases. So I, I described detecting the performance impacting commits. 
Uh, that's the build barons are going to do. We have screens set up to make it easy for them, but they're going to work on taking from the system when performance changes, triage it, and assign it out. Um, and so we'll get assigned to a developer to diagnose the performance regression. Um, they get to play with all the tools at this point, figure out what's going on, use your profilers, run the tests, all those things, and figure out what's going on. Um, then they'll, so that's developers normally. Uh, on the really hard ones, uh, my team will come in also. Um, and then the developer is going to have a proposed change to fix that performance regression. So they will test that before committing it. So they need to be able to test changes. And so again, that'll be developers. Um, the whole system works because we have tests. And so we have a constant stream of new tests coming in. Uh, so we have developers, when they add a new feature, they design and add performance tests for those features that go in. And then, so that's developers, but also my team works on sort of the more holistic representative uh, workloads going in. You know, there was um, a couple of references. Uh, well, in Sam's talk, there was reference to uh, the workload as model. Now I'm mixing multiple people's talks, sorry. Um, but we want to know, we have lots and lots of tests and we want to know what really matters. And so we the end-to-end -end representative workloads that we use to decide what is the real state of things is going to be coming from, from my team. Uh, we support the release. We need to, the, the system that I described so far will find all of the changes in performance over time. You get to the release time, you want to know not just um, not just how many changes there were, but you want to know what the net impact of it is. And so you need to be able to look back at the system and see where do we stand relative to some other point. Um, and so that would be, my team keeps an eye on that. We review that with management um, and, and that's a regular process. Uh, and finally, the funnest one for me is sort of the performance exploration where we get to into some of the maybe more interesting things for this group, which is, uh, figuring out interesting things about the performance of MongoDB. You know, where could it be improved? What is it sensitive to? Where, where should we invest our, our efforts? Um, and so that, that is my team and, you know, we get to play with the, the fun stuff at that point. So at a high level, that's what we do for performance testing at MongoDB. Obviously that's a simplification and it leaves some things out but at least where I sit, that captures the major components. So uh, let's get in some opinions then, uh, which match up with some of the previous talks. And this covers what I would like to see from performance engineering education, You know what I would like to see coming in. And since this is a workshop on education, I felt free to include a classical quote um, from Socrates in Plato's Apology, um, condensed a little bit. But so I asked myself whether I should prefer to be as I am with neither their wisdom nor their ignorance or to have both. The answer I gave was that it was to my advantage to be as I am. So this was in Socrates' Apology where he was defending himself very obnoxiously against uh, claims of treason uh, and so the Oracle at Delphi told him he was the smartest person in the world. And the punchline was he was the smartest person in the world because he knew that he didn't know anything. Um, what I love about this besides its complete obnoxiousness um, is the way it captures the idea of the importance of knowing what you don't know and understanding why you do or don't know something. And so uh, that'll come back. Um, uh, all right, so let's focus it down a little bit. What would I like to see developers knowing? And this maybe fits a little bit more with uh, Christina's talk on um, performance testing in a distributed systems curriculum or just a more core curriculum. We hire a lot of developers 
straight out of college. They're awesome. They do wonderful things. Um, here's what I would like them to know about performance when they come in. And by the way, this is Ling Z. He nails all these things. So first and foremost, uh, I want them to understand the question, how do I understand the performance of my code? Um, how to set up an experiment, enumerate and check the assumptions that go into that and collect the results and know what you can and cannot conclude uh, from that. Um, much more the experimental design than any of the actual mechanics of it. Um, all right. I'd like them to understand that there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're benchmarking things, when you're testing the performance of something. There's the test noise, there's correlations, um, things aren't normally distributed, um, just all sorts of things. And I don't need them to be an expert in any of that, but just to be aware that things can go wrong and to tread lightly and, and be aware of that. Um, I'd like them to understand that performance is emergent often. So you can have uh, your unit and you can test your unit and have it perform great. And there can be a unit built on top of it and it can have its tests and it can look great on those tests. And when you put them together, it can all go to hell. And it does all go to hell. Um, there's assumption mismatches. I'm going to stop myself from a digression right now um, and move on uh, about a big assumption uh, mismatch we had at one point. Um, a little bit of math would be nice. Not a lot of math, just a little bit of math. Enough to be able to reason about the system a little bit and sanity check your results. So um, Whittle's Law was called out before. I love Whittle's Law. It's incredibly powerful. The concepts of stationarity and non-stationarity, you know, that, that that's a thing. Um, how an MM1Q works, right? Um, it, it is informative of a lot of things. And some of these things were called out before. Um, and so definitely not like, I don't want them learning Greek in order to, to have this, but just a little bit, just the, the roughest models that they can use to sanity check something. Uh, and uh, now I will digress for a second. Uh, in a previous job, I worked at IBM Research doing uh, computer performance testing. And we had two levels of models. We had spreadsheet models and we had detailed simulations and we had nothing in between. And both were incredibly valuable, but you know, it sort of reiterates that a little bit of math uh, can be really informative as you go through things. All right. Uh, and uh, this was inherent in all of the things I already said, but a healthy skepticism uh, to their own results, to anybody else's results. You know, hey, I made something 12 times faster. Really? Are you sure? Um, did you, do you test that? Why do you know that? Um, yeah. And then the other role I was going to talk through was the performance engineer. So, so my team. So what would I like uh, for some of my team? Well, everything I just discussed, I'd like all of that, obviously pretty well done. Um, combined with a deep dive into some aspect of performance that could be theory that can then inform practice. Uh, it could be a particular skill in creating test cases to show different phenomena. Uh, it could be a particular skill in figuring out what happened and debugging things. Um, and as we actually, as we hired people for the team and as we continue to, we always look for complementary skills there. You know, so we, we specifically focus on not having a set of copycats, all who have the same set of skills, but having some base levels of skill combined with being great at something. So giving someone the chance to be great at, at one of those things. Um, writing and communication. This was called out at least once or twice uh, before. Uh, and if I was better with my notes, I would credit somebody. But 
can you convey your understanding of performance to somebody else? If you can't, your results are meaningless to me. Um, we're trying to change the performance of a server that has hundreds of developers on it. And so if you can't convey why uh, something performs the way it does and what should be done about it, uh, you're just wasting everybody's time. So that is a key requirement uh, for somebody working uh, here. And finally, you know, to loop back to Socrates at the beginning, how do I know what I know? Um, this was called out in the developer, but much more so here. Can you be able to list all of your assumptions and say what you did to verify those assumptions and what the limits are of those conclusions? Um, it, it's, incredi it's incredibly important. And, and if it's with the writing, like we put summaries on all the things we do backed up by detail. And because we have a history of showing, we know, not only do we know what we're doing, but we've explained exactly how we know what we're doing. It gives confidence to people to um, trust the conclusions and, and operate based on that. Um, and it also goes to reproducibility that we talked about. So if someone picks it up, they can go reproduce what we did because we explained exactly what we did, what the assumptions were, what was important and the limits of what we knew. Uh, if I had to boil all of that down into one sentence, uh, it would be teach how to think about performance instead of how to do performance work. Um, learning how to think the right way, to question everything, to state your assumptions, to do a good experiment, that's hard and it takes rigor. Learning how to do it, that's fun. Um, I can teach somebody how to profile something. I can teach someone how to use our infrastructure. Hell, I don't need to most of the time because everyone wants to do it and they can learn it themselves. But learning how to think and reason about the stuff, that's the skill that lasts forever and is the hard part that, that our people would really benefit. All right, so enough of my opinions. Uh, I'll finish briefly with some observations uh, from, from the field. So first off, for my team, we don't hire performance engineers out of college. And this is really a rather striking statement because at MongoDB, we hire a lot of people right out of college. We have a great new grad problem fed in by our intern program, and we get incredible people in. Um, but the new grads don't have the background we need for my team doing the performance engineering work. They just don't. Um, so where do we get people from? Well, we either get people who are testing performance elsewhere and doing a particularly good job at that. Or we get people who are established in the field. Uh, Alex is running a a competing workshop right now, uh, so he can't be here right now. But uh, Or you get the internal expert, the person who has figured out all the stuff themselves and who, you know, in their existing job had built up an expertise that learned how to do all that questioning and validation, and who was the person who people come to for the hard performance problems because they just figured it out. All, those skills are teachable. I'm a firm believer that all skills are teachable. So it'd be great if I could teach people that rather than having to find the people who had learned it uh, themselves. And just a little bit on background, the people I've worked with over the years who are full-time performance people have largely one or two backgrounds. They either have a PhD, um, or a physics background, um, which gave them the rigor to think about things really well or enforced, verified they had the rigor if nothing else. Uh, and the wizards, the people who figured things out themselves and who everyone knew to come to for performance problems. Um, we should be able to get a bigger pool than this going into performance work. Um, so, uh, that's where I got, that's, you know, my opinions and observations and what we do. Uh, I had lots of opinions on everybody else's talks also. 
uh, hopefully some of it uh, reinforces and fits well together and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. It has been like a very interesting presentation and lots of uh, discussions after our next talk, right? So the questions for Dave now? Oh, wow, lots of in the chat. Yes, so Alex has been putting everything on the Slack and numbering very nice. Thanks, Alex, for that. It's cool. very I'm nice to organize the Slack now. And if there are no questions, we can move to Kony's uh, presentation. Uh, software performance in your education, what topic should we cover? Uh, Kony, can you share and take from there? Sure. Okay. Can you see? Yes, you can. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, um, actually a software um, focus of performance engineering. So this little, little chart at the top is uh, appears in most of the talks I've given over the years, and it shows a balance scale where you're looking at um, resource requirements that software uh, has versus capacity. This scale shows that the capacity is insufficient to support the new software. And what is um, the focus here is on the software architecture and design itself, as opposed to tuning the capacity. Ideally, it happens early in development so that we prevent problems instead of detecting them and fixing them later. And when we do, and often it is the case that we're fixing problems, we do it with this designed-based approach as opposed to tuning the platform. So um, the topics that I'm going to suggest here um, are based on this software view of performance engineering rather than a systems view of performance engineering. So what skills do you need, what topics do you need to cover if you're going to teach someone how to do this? Well, you need the technical skills, obviously, and the technical skills are in the area of software development, things like different design methods and notations, different development paradigms that include SPE. And we need to know something about the domain that the software is executing in. And actually many other things, but those are certainly really important ones. Um, we also need to know about software performance modeling and evaluation. So not only the system models that we've heard about this morning, um, things like the queuing network, like stochastic petri nets, like simulation, like reliability and so forth, but also the software execution models. <clears throat> and here um, in the diagram, I'm showing an execution graph model that models the steps in the software that we are evaluating. And then we need to know uh, about benchmarking and testing. And I think others have done an excellent job of describing that. So um, the only thing that I would add to what has been said specifically for software performance engineering is that um, the software performance engineering is a scenario-based approach. We identify scenarios that are important to us and um, do our modeling and evaluation of those scenarios. So when it comes time to do performance testing, we want to be sure and measure and evaluate those software scenarios. And then finally, when you do find problems, we need to know how to improve them. Things like patterns and anti-patterns and some of the measurement approaches that we've heard about so far. We also need a whole host of practical skills. And I've heard this mentioned already. Um, people need uh, 
experience on real systems and how do you get that? Um, that could be the topic of a whole nother talk about how we can create a repository of some in some way so that people can get real experience. It turns out that performance engineering is always based on state-of-the-art systems. You're always evaluating something new, some new you know, stretch of technology. And that's because if we understood the technology already, then we wouldn't have quite the need for the performance engineering during development. We would already have that experience base and could use it. So we're always doing something that puts us in an, an uncomfortable zone. There's not any way to teach that ahead of time. You have to just, as David said, you have to have the skills that uh, give you the confidence that you can apply the same techniques to yet a new system. And then these um, meta skills, such as working, communicating results, working with other people, working in a team and so forth, um, are also um, vital when it comes to being an effective performance engineer. So now the, I wanna just mention a few other things that uh, some ideas for maybe things that we could develop for future use. And one of them is to have some business case studies. So in other words, like Harvard Business Review has um, a vast repository of um, even software projects and they'll look at things that went right and they'll look at things that went wrong. And um, it's both a management focus and a technical focus. So if we could somehow create a whole slew of examples and maybe even put them into the HBR so that um, it's something that's studied as part of project management, things like you know the, um, the Denver airport baggage system when it was first deployed and all the problems that it had, the healthcare.gov, um, that's a little bit of a problem because when people fail, they don't really like to document the failures. But when you plug it into this HBR paradigm, you know, it's a bonus to be able to um, illustrate what went wrong and why. And I think that would go a long way to educating people on how to prevent those problems in the future. And I, I forgot this say this in the beginning, but I would like for you to use the chat as we go along. If you're already doing some of these things, or if you think of other things that I've overlooked, uh, please add those things to the chat because I would like to, to know about it and then we can capture them and perhaps um, address them later. <clears throat> Another thing that I, I think is missing is performance engineering history. And, you know, if we don't know the history, then we're going to be condemned to repeat it. Um, so we have over 50 years of history with performance engineering and also software performance engineering. Much of it is not on the internet. And <clears throat> the younger generation doesn't acknowledge that anything existed before the internet. So we need to find a way to actually get some of this history documented and available. And for example, when I was putting together this talk, I went out and looked at what was on Wikipedia on performance engineering. And first of all, there's not a software performance engineering, but there is a performance engineering. And it's really pretty sad. I was, would encourage you to go and look at what's out there. We need to fix this. You know, people need to be more aware of what really exists. Uh, and I apologize if one of you wrote this, but it's a little bit dated and it needs to be updated. So along those lines, I, in case you're not aware of some of this, I'd just like to offer that, uh, you know, in the early days of computing, performance engineering was vital. Everybody did it. It was, you know, uh, this the way you develop things. And in some um, extreme cases, such as flight control software and other very critical systems, 
they had um, what we now call a digital twin, but what it was was a uh, detailed simulation and emulation of the software system. And before any changes were put into the system, they had to be put into that simulator first to confirm that it would work before they were even allowed to touch the software. And so that's where performance got a bad name because it was very labor intensive and it took a lot of time um, to do that. And so what, what happened then was the fix it later philosophy was born. And it happened coincidentally to be just after the um, IBM 360 uh, MVS operating system was introduced because there were a whole bunch of features there that gave us a little breathing room and performance wasn't as critical as it was in those uh, serious cases. And so the fix it later philosophy is don't worry about performance. If it's a problem, we can always tune it later. And um, in some cases that works just fine, but in critical systems, it doesn't work just fine. Um, in terms of history, the commercial performance modeling tools that I'm aware of originated in the early 1970s. Um, the term software performance engineering I coined in a 1981 paper that was um, published in the CMG proceedings. And the, my PhD thesis on performance modeling of software designs was in 1980. So I think some of these things, and well, these things, and also a lot of others in terms of performance modeling, um, it, back in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, early 80s, there were a tremendous number of breakthroughs in performance modeling technology. And because it's not on the internet, and because they were studying a lot of um, hypothetical problems, they're not widely known today. And, uh, you know, uh, the performance modeling is not taught in that many universities, not certainly not to the depth that it was when I took it in the 70s. Um, and so we're losing a lot of that technology that we need to reclaim. So those are basically hitting on some of the things that I think are missing that need some attention. And um, I was happy to see that a lot of the other topics that are also important in this paradigm have already been covered in our earlier talks. One of the things I liked um, in some of the earlier talks was the way um, that these topics are worked into other courses. And uh, Domenico Ferrari wrote a paper on the insularity of performance engineering some years ago. And he uh, postulated that it was a mistake to have our own self-contained uh, courses, that we needed to fit them into other courses. And I think that's a great idea. I think it's a way to attract students maybe into um, focusing on performance engineering if they get some glimpses of it in courses like um, the ones that have been talked about earlier, then maybe it would pique their interest and they would want to delve deeper into it. Um, and then also, I think David made a good point that there's a really a difference in training and in education. And in universities, we're not really in the business of training. We're really more in the business of educating people, teaching them the fundamentals that they can then apply to these new systems uh, when they get involved with them. So some of the points I, I wanted to emphasize in this talk are um, that I, I think it's important to put the software focus in performance engineering, um, that I think we ought to be covering the fundamentals of modeling and development and the practice of SPE. And we need to spend some time finding ways to make it real. So like, covering the HBR style business cases, but also software systems themselves. We find it uh, problematic trying to find case studies to illustrate concepts that we document in performance engineering papers. And if we had a repository, it would go a long way towards 
making things more repeatable and also um, relevant to real systems. I think we need to cover the history and I think those of us in this talk in particular um, should start to contribute some of the information that we know that we experienced and that hasn't really been documented um, completely. And to find a way to integrate it with these other relevant fields of study in engineering and in management um, would go a long way. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Connie. That was a very insightful talk. Not lots of nice recommendations for the discussions, right? So we are now on the discussion section. So do you have any specific questions for Kone first? Anybody has questions, specific questions? For Kone? I have a general observation. Uh, Zoom sessions uh, seem to prevent jokes. Even Connie didn't have any joke today, right? <laughs> so how do we fix that? Yeah, that's only face-to-face, -face, I think. <laughs> no, there, there is a trade-off between face-to-face -face and Zoom. No. But this has been very efficient on the other end. We, we cover a large amount of material in a very short amount of time, right? Well, it's I a trade-off. Every, yeah. every, every style has their own benefits. So Alex has put all these uh, questions and comments on the Slack nicely numbered. So the objective of this section now called discussion is for us to create a summary of the workshop with rec specific recommendations based on the discussions. So Alex, I suggest if you go to the Slack mm -hmm. and read the questions. I, I will do this in a second. I just wanted to point out that one sure way to not get either questions or personal interaction is to only go to Slack. So if we don't ask the questions, then uh, I don't know, to, to, I, I think to, to Connie, to Christina. To, so there were a few talks in which I think not even yeah. one question was asked. Perhaps we could still ask a question now. Yeah, so yes, yeah. I'll, I'll follow up on that. I uh, suggest Connie. you can run this discussion now, Alex, if you like. Run the discussion section and uh, make manage it. And I'll try to capture the recommendations on, on the slide. Huh? So let, let, let me follow up on uh, Connie's uh, talk. Uh, you, so you, you, you mentioned these case studies, right? So uh, as I mentioned on the Slack, uh, at the, uh, the IFIP performance conference uh, that's coming up in, in, in November, there's going to be a workshop on education um, performance analysis. And one of the uh, invited speakers is uh, Giuseppe uh, Sarazzi from uh, uh, Polytechnic. Uh, Milano, and he suggested uh, creating a wiki for performance engineering, where you have these case studies uh, for for where people contribute case studies uh, for uh, for others to 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 use in in their courses. Uh, do you think that would work? I think that's an excellent idea. I would like to see that happen. What would such case studies look like? Well, I, the case studies I think are difficult because you want realistic ones, and yet we we've seen some of the ethical issues with having real systems in this repository. So um, I have seen some model problems that have been developed and are available, and I think that's an excellent way to go. And if we could have a repository of those, um, and you know find some way to incentivize people to put their case studies out there uh, to share with others instead of trying to hide mistakes. What would the incentive look like? I don't know, but uh, you know, I think, I think companies are, are excited to have their case studies covered in Harvard Business Review, right? It gives them some kind of status and so if we could find a way to make that valuable i think we need to find a way to convince companies that putting out case studies like this would reinforce their credibility 
their ability to recover from mistakes like that instead of trying to sweep them under the rug because they might be signs of incompetence. Mm -hmm. and if, they've if they've actually caught something before it's gone out or in the case of healthcare.gov, which was government subsidized, they showed how to recover from something like this and they openly described what was going on, that would be very worthwhile. But there's a lot of secretiveness about all this because of competitive edge and things like that. Right, right. It's an interesting topic, and I ask in a very self-interested manner because you know I'm trying to to convince you know my management to help be more open on, on more stuff. And I'm starting from a point of working from an open source company, so we're our code's already all out there. Our test infrastructure is already all the way out there, and yet you still hit some resistance of what's the what's the benefit, what's the risk. And the risk is always someone goes cherry picks your data and tries to make you look like a fool. Um, and so I'm trying to make the, the benefit side. So extra ammunition is always uh, appreciated. Well, I, but perhaps if you put some of the challenges out there, you could attract talent to help you solve some of those challenges. Maybe that would be an incentive. I don't know. I was overtly discouraged I, we when, when I was at Siemens, we were overtly discouraged from participating in external hackathons because of IP issues. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I think SPEC um, has a history, don't they, of sharing information that with, amongst competitors? So maybe SPEC is the right home for something like that. But, uh, you can uh, present the the model, the testing, the approach, right? And you can anonymize the company, for example, to prevent people from attacking the company. Don't have to mention that came from MongoDB, right? What's important is this is a large company, database company. It's open source. We have these problems, have this methodology, and you prevented all these losses because we solved these problems this way, right? I have a yeah, crazy idea. Like if you want a reproducible, you know, if you want a case study that someone can go and play with, right? You need, you need the the, the data and go to MongoDB. Yeah. Like, yeah. if I could show you, like, this commit introduced this regression, and it took us a month to find it because of this stupidity, and it was eventually solved this way. Like, I think that's the kind of case study that you'd be talking about. Um, but you 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 can anonymize that one. I don't think. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to put a misconfigured system out there on spec or somewhere mm -hmm. like that, uh, or a misarchitected system and then have a contest to see who can diagnose what's happening inside and make that part of a collective performance curriculum so that universities can compete against each other to figure out what's going on. Yeah, that's nice. Very nice. Oh. That's an excellent idea. So I okay. So so Andre took uh, took not not he didn't take he actually stated this. Uh, keep in mind the scheduling community has or runs uh, a yearly competition. I think it's on satisfiability, and therefore the the principles of this I think could be could be imported from there. They have some some rules and regulations. Universities include this competition in their uh, courses. Uh, students typically submit results uh, and companies know that if they want to access some of the most uh, exciting uh, students on the market, then they want to contribute to that year's uh, set of problems. I think there are a few like five, six problems for, for each year. Um, and th the other idea about incentives that I have comes from uh, collecting and sharing well, use cases if you want, performance data if you want. So operational traces from different kinds of large distributed systems. So we, we every year we go to different companies and we ask them to give us traces. And every year we get 100 rejects for every two, three that say yes. And from the two, three that say yes, it takes two, three years of lead time to actually get those traces because these kinds of requests need to go to uh, lawyers, I think, are the, the most important uh, hurdle. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but the the incentive is it, it at the start of a field there's no incentive and everything you get is basically through begging and you really need good partners in the industry who want to do this because they care about the field but once those few five six cases are out there what you seem to get is that other companies can be pressured into contributing because if, if Google has something out there, then also Facebook and the others need to have something out there. And it works at every level and in every sector that we worked with. Alexandru, I think there might be a better way to think about this. Um, rather than thinking about case studies where people made a mistake and it was corrected, which I think has the wrong focus. Uh, it might be better to think in terms of types of problems and types of skills needed. And, and then artificial cases can illustrate what we, we're concerned about. We can abstract them from case studies we know about and, and create something that people can learn from. One of my sons is teaching physics in Edmonton and he's just been teaching a lab course. And their whole point of this course, and they spend a whole term on it and they're just learning how to do difficult experiments, how to use instrumentation to do hard things. Uh, and they have to teach this from the ground up, even though the students are quite sophisticated because they've been in the classroom. They haven't been in the lab enough. And, and uh, maybe an approach based on how you, how you, what the problems are and how you solve them makes more sense than case studies. I mean, students don't study how they measured something at CERN, physics students. They study how to do things themselves. Um, I, so I, I think the case studies may be an attractive um, but blind alley. I, I, I'm trying to at the same time elicit more comments and type in summaries of what everyone says. I see uh, Andre. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. And there's a, there's a- I'd, I'd like to riff off something that David said. If we had one of these projects, you could have a diverse student base, students with different levels of background who may have taken different courses, maybe even in different departments. So you might have a student who knows operating systems, another student who knows computer networks, another one who's doing research on databases, another one who's doing research on machine learning or something like that and throw them all together and try and find a, try and find a problem for them to work on that exercises all those areas of expertise a system to work on, a dummy, a dummy misconfigured system, or maybe we could do some nasty things to shock, sock shop or train ticket or one of those open source things and have the students do an application flow analysis. Uh, you have some test scripts that are running so you can see what the problem actually is and so on. I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. I'm going to shut it off. Things like that. Andre, that, that, that could be anti-pattern based and teach two things with one stone, as it were. You could, you could insert anti-patterns and have people look for them. Oh yeah, sure. Yes, uh, I'm looking for a benchmark to be able to insert anti-patterns, right? This is the, I was asking Sam about this, right? Previously, right? Well, uh, so. well benchmark is kind of tricky. But, uh, you know, this in the reliability community, you know, this vulnerability injection stuff, Marco uh, is working on this, right? So, you know, this, so yeah. they basically introduce vulnerability artificially, mm -hmm. test, yeah. you know, how systems, so maybe some inspiration from that community. No, exactly. I, I talked to Marco about this, right? It's the, it's yes. the, uh, Failure injection, fault injection, as related to performance and scalability. Yeah, mm -hmm. that goes into injecting anti-patterns. Like, what are the types of problems that you're trying to inject? How can you identify, detect, and recommend this automated solution to this, which would be the dream, right? To be able to do all this thing automatically. Yeah? Yes, I like the idea very much. In fact. We have had similar things, but in different contexts. For example, for security, right. there is always this hacker contests type of uh, events organized also as part of courses. We have it also in Würzburg now. 
where basically people are given a system which where people know it has some security holes, right? So then they have to attack it and use this so that they have to find the weaknesses and to successfully manage to attack this system and uh, exploit the vulnerabilities. So similar things with, let's say, performance anti-patterns in a system given to performance engineering students. And we just tell them, you know, they should evaluate the design and see if there are any issues and suggest performance improvements and so forth or refactoring. So this could be very effective actually. One could have, for example, in Connie's book, all these patterns and others in the literature, you put them artificially in, in the application design and then give them to students. Here is a design. What do you do about it? And uh, in this way, like, one could also evaluate uh, students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suggest two swizzles on that. Um, one is making sure to install some anti-patterns which don't show until you get to a, a non-expected you know, operating condition, you know, like a scale to some size before it matters. And also conversely, putting in an anti-pattern, something that has a bad, bad behavior, but you will never hit, mm -hmm. you know, to, to focus on, you know, to me, if, if it never occurs, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, yeah, so just like put in the things, you know, find, you know, not just find the anti pattern, but find when it matters and if it does mm -hmm. matter. So yeah, the, yes. the important thing is have the ability to detect what's really happening in your system, right? The, the stuff that matters, right? Yes. Clearly, it has to matter. Yes. We have to educate people on what matters. It may be a, it may be a, a pathology that occurs very seldom, but that could occur very often if operating cha conditions change or if there's a black swan. Yeah, uh, so we need to understand what the maximum social cost or engineering cost would be right. if the if the problem does occur. Yeah, it's a risk assessment approach. The probability yeah. of occurrence and the impact. You have to take the impact on the yes. revenue, whatever is the metric of impact that's relevant to that system. Right? Two to follow up on a, a point that David made earlier, we say that uh, a, a, a little math uh, would be really nice and, and how to think about performance. Uh, would, uh, you know, it, other than case studies, uh, would it make sense to have, let's say, small nuggets of these math things uh, put into a form of a wiki, let's say, that uh, that uh, your engineers can can uh, pick up on. Well, I, I I would love that, especially if it kept to the the spirit of a little math, um, you know, so that it's very easy. Like like I'm sure if you looked at the Wikipedia page for Little's Law, that you can find in probably embarrassing amount of detail on it. Um, but if you keep it like. Here's the simple stuff. And actually, I think um, I think Sam's book actually does a decent job of this also. But just, you know, here's here's the important stuff, just that, and uh, that'd be cool. Great. Other than Little Snow, do you have uh, uh, some uh, other, no, Little, you, you mentioned Little Snow and MM1 and uh, what else would be the most basic things that they should know? I mean, so those were my examples that I came up with. I would punt to you guys because you guys are thinking about the theory much more, you know, regularly than I am. Uh, those are the first two that come to mind, but just things where you could just look at a black box and start reasoning about it. You, there's lots of cues and systems. Um, everything's, and well, also applies to everything. There's queuing everywhere you know, the things that just come up all the time in, in software systems. So how about this, right? The, you know, rather than, so let's say we, we have a, a, a little, uh, if you like, a little wiki on, on little slow, and rather than you know, pages and pages on, on the proof, we have uh, case studies that, that make use of little slow, uh, you know, or, or 
yeah, examples from papers or, or from real cases that make use of Little's Law to understand what the issues are, what the problems are, what the solutions are. Would that work? Would that appeal to your engineers? I think including the sanity checks in the case studies is would be beneficial. Yeah. So, you know, maybe not setting them up to fail, but setting up things where it's like, if you're working through the case study and this is, we know that this is reasonable because of, you know, X, like it's in the ballpark and doing the check that that would be uh, additive and, and helpful. To have the discussion a bit shift in to, to cover in a sense all the uh, well all the talks because I think what we wanted to do is to again to 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 have a discussion around all the topics. Um, but perhaps as a as a question, um, on the one hand, everyone wants, seems to want to hire clever individuals who can think out of the box or at least think visibly think. Uh, but on the other hand, especially what we see with increasingly larger numbers of students is that many students are demanding recipes that they can learn so they can pass courses and get a degree. The pressure on the degree is so high that the curiosity and pleasure may be second to or secondary to thinking right to, to sorry to 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 getting the the degree um how do you see this this tension because we we keep asking for deeper more meaningful analysis and a better understanding of the fundamentals rather than on let's say tools or or such things and i think everyone in this room agrees and i think at least 75% of our students would disagree with this because they need a degree. So would you care to comment on, again, lots of ideas, but how would that actually work in practice? Yeah, Andre, go ahead. Um, Vittoria and others have made the point that we mustn't neglect the foundations. We need the foundations there so that the students understand when they're not being rigorous. That and and drumming in the foundations conforms to the university pressures of getting through, getting the degree and all that. So the question then becomes, is there a way of having some kind of practicum along the lines of a German apprentice system? Because really you only learn this stuff by actually working with people in the field who've been doing it for a while or with people who are willing to experiment. And for, for some time, I, I uh, for, for, I started out when the performance field was actually quite young and people weren't quite sure how to do it. And the people who were doing it were mathematicians, physicists, economists, even philosophers and people like that. And you learned it, you learned it by doing it, but the foundation that I had in statistics at the time helped me organize my thoughts about what it was that we were trying to do. Combining that with the system knowledge that I acquired while doing a computer science degree helped me do it better. I think one of our problems is that this is a very interdisciplinary field. Uh, and we need to find, we need to have develop, cultivate a mindset among the students in which they're willing to draw on lots of different disciplines in order to pull things together and, and develop insights. And that's very, very hard. It's also hard for academic funders to support that kind of thing. It's not tangible. I, I was just going to add for the um, for your students is just thinking back to my. It was stressed when I was an undergrad. It's easy to think about going back to undergrad. Skills have a very short half life. I mean, I, I was going to look up at what books I have on my shelf, but I threw out half of the books because they are no longer relevant. Um, when, hell, I learned C++ when I was an undergrad. And when I interviewed at MongoDB, I almost said I knew C++. 
And I realized, thankfully I did it. And I realized afterwards, I did not know what they were calling C++. C++ had changed so much over the years as to be unrecognizable. And, you know, so skills have a very short half-life. Thinking and being able to reason about things and being able to learn those new skills is the thing of value out of that degree. And so you know, like just drill that into your students. Absolutely. But when you look at job recruitment ads, many of them emphasize an alphabet soup of particular skills rather than thought processes. And if you don't have that skill, you might be considered a dinosaur. It's, it's really tough. And I've, I've heard the complaint that you're making at, at many conferences over the years that people are, th that, that, and even from, even from some universities, I was an academic advisor to NJIT for a while, or rather an industrial advisor to NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, which is just up the road from me. And uh, they, the faculty there felt tremendous pressure from industry to churn people out with skills rather than foundations because they didn't want to invest in training people to acquire those skills. I think that's the source of the original sin. So I agree uh, the, about the many companies asking for skills and as a result, students wanting them. But it's still a very bad use of our time to teach them these skills that will go like that will become obsolete very soon. So I actually think that a kind of a middle ground is to encourage some sort of um, a, the, a, to encourage at the student level that they teach each other skills like you know their student clubs and they can teach each other specific skills that and say, okay, this is useful for if you're going to data analysis, this is useful if you're going to web development and things like that. Because professors, we can teach them the more important theoretical, uh, you know, foundations that they cannot get from other students or, or from an internship maybe. Uh, so it is fine that students care about this and we should be graduating them with some important skills but sometimes the classroom, like the traditional classroom is not the best place for, for these. Oh, right, um, right. We want to cultivate the idea that any skill we teach them is an example. Yes, exactly. Uh, the, uh, can I say something? There is an issue that probably didn't raise yet in the discussion, which is how many hours do we teach these uh, kind of topics in our curricula? That's, that's a fundamental, uh, I mean, issue because of course we, we all would like to teach more, I mean, deeper concept or other things, detailed ones, but uh, at least in our curricula, I've been able to introduce one advanced course to graduate students, uh, which is about, let's say, general extra functional properties, uh, performance and reliability, uh, which is six credits. Uh, but it, it is it is very difficult to find more time to you know starting from fundamental and going to advanced concept. So after all, uh, um, the issue of uh, you know making these topics important in the career of a computer scientist or a software engineer today is still I think one issue that has to be pursued because the number of hours that are dedicated to these topics it is. Uh, I mean, it is a fundamental parameter after all. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I basically agree with uh, what uh, Vittorio just said. Um, the, the most important uh, idea, I think, is uh, try to hide somehow this content inside other courses so because students uh, don't like to study theory because in the past i was i had a, a, a performance engineering class just that was called just performance engineering and students didn't like the class because because it uh, it was not uh, they didn't see um it was just a few hours so it, 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 i i haven't uh, I, had, I didn't have time for, to cover uh, in detail application or case studies so i had to just introduce concept i, I 
try to to cover to to make it as, as practical as possible but uh, they they could not uh, um, understand the actual applicability so if you try to hide these concepts in other courses and you try to mix uh, theory and so the the methodological approaches the, the so the the way the way the, the, to teach uh, them thinking the concept and then to, to see immediately the application then they are much happier because they they just see application uh, exact applications of what they they've learned uh, uh, and so they it would be much easier and the mar much more successful for them because they can see their skills or their competencies and so they acquire skills and competencies and they see also they they let's say theoretical part uh, that of, uh, of this uh, to to develop this uh, performance engineering concept uh, uh, and to be able to assess performance uh, the quality and the of, uh, of service and everything like this but uh, um, in uh, at least from my experience a, a pure performance engineering class uh, is not very successful for students i i have the same experience if we call it performance engineering it attracts some set of students, maybe in our case, about maybe 20 people or something like that, sometimes 30, depends on the year. But uh, you cannot scale much beyond that. It's basically a small amount of people. They're interested, some of them are very motivated, others drop during the course when the theoretical stuff comes. But if you package this differently, uh, now I'm experimenting now with the benchmarking idea, I'm going to call it systems benchmarking. At least the initial experience I have is a little bit more interest because they look at it more practical. And uh, of course, you can still include some of the topics like operational analysis, uh, queuing models, basic queuing models. You can still include them in such a course, even though it's called systems benchmarking, right? It sounds a little bit more interesting for them because they think, oh, there are so many things compared nowadays, and this teaches me how to compare and evaluate. So they find a little bit broader application domain. And the second thing is, I also now started to not limit these topics to computer systems evaluation. This was originally, it was actually called uh, benchmarking and performance engineering of computer systems or something like this. Now I, I call it basically of systems. This has a wider application because mathematically speaking is the same thing. You can measure the performance of a manufacturing machine in an industry for industry environment, or, or you can measure something completely technical. So mathematically speaking is the same thing. So this also increases uh, interest. Speaking of systems versus computer systems. And then saying, okay, computer system is just an example. I picked an example here I'm taking uh, a database management system as an example, right? I see a, a hand up, YC, yeah? Yeah, so uh, Sam, I, I agree with you that, you know, you, 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 could have, you, you can think about injecting benchmarking into a course for database systems and injecting benchmarking into a course on distributed systems, on uh, storage yes. architecture, etc. And uh, this, this uh, goes back to what Maria and Connie uh, spoke about just now. Um, it, Maria was saying that you, 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 you don't want to have a course on performance modeling or performance analysis. You want to just inject this into to, to other courses, right? I think Connie will remember uh, years ago when there was this, an attempt at this. Uh, Larry Dowdy has this book about a performance supplement for operating systems. Uh, and then the idea was to have a performance supplement for database system, performance supplement for this and that other thing. Um, unfortunately, the idea uh, didn't, didn't take off. Uh, they only stopped at operating systems. Um, and so I'm wondering whether uh, it, it is time to try it again, uh, you know, have a kind of um, little nuggets that we can offer to, to the operating systems community, to the hardware community, to the uh, database community that they can incorporate into their curriculum. I, I'd, like, I'd like to add a slightly different comment. We call our course Design of High Performance Software. 
and we get 40 students. Just the shift of emphasis. But something else has occurred to me listening to this discussion. There's another group of people who have a similar problem to ours, and that's the operations research community, dealing with industry generally, modeling and improvement. And so they have a lot of lessons they could maybe teach us about how to incorporate their, their material along with the material about how you design and manage systems, which is what their, their students are also interested in. Because what really, performance is the operations research of computer systems, when you think of it how they work, how to make them work better. That's it. Conversation slobber. Sorry. Now, so I was going to jump in with a question in that pause, which is all the discussion so far has been focused on undergraduate uh, CS curriculum. Um, what about continuing ed, you know, because, you know, I, I would love to refer people to stuff if there were things, we buy books, we get things for people, we run seminars internally. Has that been a path in the past, you know, like it, it, it can't be, you know, a full class, that's a high bar, but, you know, chunks of things for continuing ed or just any way to people are out in the field who are like, I find myself working on these problems. Can you backfill some of this stuff for me, some of the concepts? So I, I suggest uh, we try to summarize the top recommendations we got here uh, from uh, the Slack and the discussion because the one of the objectives we set us was to to end the the meeting with the summary of the specific recommendations, and I, I'd like to share my screen so we can review what I've been doing here. Uh, can you see my screen, guys? So I have taken thirteen. Uh, recommendations from the discussion that we had just had. Uh, general performance modeling monitor principles shall be included in related courses, such as functional testing, and you probably can recognize where this came from. Fix the wiki on performance engineering. Add performance engineering to more general CS courses. Make performance problems real by publishing detailed analysis of what went wrong and large after disaster like the airport baggage, conveyor belt or healthcare.gov, develop a repository of realistic case studies, have a misconfigured system to have competition among students on performance analysis and recommendations for improvement, identify types of problems and type of skills required to solve the related performance issues, develop a wiki with the little math that can be useful for practitioners, must not neglect the foundations of performance modeling, resist the pull from students to give them prescriptive formulas to, impl to implement in Python-like languages, encourage at the student level for them to teach each other useful skills required for performance, increase the number of hours related to performance engineering to standard curriculum, Try to add these concepts to other courses to overcome student resistance and to theory, mixed theory with methodological use, application of to practical system, assess performance and quality of service, use performance courses as supplement to specific courses, suggest operation, operation systems, databases, etc. So are there any other things that I did mention that was uh, important from the Slack or from additional suggestions that you might have? Alberto, from 12 and 13, there is a practical suggestion, which is wear the clothes of your colleagues that teach mobile computing or very exciting courses. You wear the clothes. You know, you enter the class by fake, I mean, cheating that you are the professor and then you put some cute theory, theory on the blackboard, you know? <laughs> 
just to, 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 to draw, I mean, to draw something all of a sudden, no? You say to students, look out there, and then you write something all of a sudden, and that's, that's the way <laughs> you cheat. Right. So. Harder to do on Zoom. Okay. Not, in, not until they fix the security issues on Zoom. <laughs> so, so Alex, from the Slack, any questions that you want to ask the presenters from Slack now that have not been asked yet? Perhaps a sort of show of hands. Um, how are you teaching performance these days when you get the chance to, to do so? Is it pure or is it more embedded in all sorts of other courses, systems or, or other things? So option one is uh, I teach a course on performance. And the second is I teach performance as part of another course on something else. I would be very curious uh, to see Can this. We vote. I, I at this point, yeah, I, I may be able to set up a sort of uh, we, survey we inside use, Slack, but uh, no, for now I'll just yeah. The check. You and just uh, put your camera on and, and raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. What I, I have see. been always doing is teach probability for engineers within which performance and reliability is uh, included. But the course is primarily on probability. As in, yes, it's, 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 it's yeah. my first book, right? Uh, for which yeah, I yeah. uh, first, eight, it's... first nine chapters of that book. Yeah, you but then course? So I hide performance and reliability in probability <laughs> rather than the other way around people are arguing. But also add, add connection with reliability. I keep saying that over and over again, number 14, uh, Alberto. So a, but there are even stronger connection than they used to be uh, between bad behavior uh, and uh, failure. Connection between performance, reliability, and availability. And yeah, performance failures, you might say performance failures. In there. Right. And performance failures. And performance failures. Yeah. So perhaps another question. Um, is, is there a need for a position paper that says this? That performance, reliability, and availability are parts of the same continuum, although or it, it, there is a good case that they are part of the same continuum, although we teach it differently, the methods are different, the communities that address this are typically different. And also case studies wise, there are many case studies in the reliability domain that I have produced and they are in my latest book. Uh, so I don't know whether that satisfies the kind of case studies that you guys are uh, referring to, but it they could, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the other recommendation is to develop automated uh, tools that include all these concepts. So instead of teaching the basic concepts, to so have a layer of abstraction where people can, can change, they can create a driver, a system on the test, they can create a, uh, inject performance problems, look at the impact of CPU and memory, different architectural deployments and the performance, have a dashboard to visualize it. Yeah. So that's one way, right? It's, but that's the way the computer science, like before people were programming assembly language and then they have compilers. Yeah. So we could have layers of abstraction for performance also, right, in that case. But going think... back to what uh, David said earlier, uh, even courses wise, I have done a lot of short courses on reliability and availability to industry. At one point, there used to be something called Motorola University, where I used to routinely offer courses on uh, system reliability and availability. I don't know whether similar things happen in performance domain as much as 
they have happened in reliability of the domains. It's a hard sell in, in my experience, but I'm wondering if we couldn't add a few more buzzwords, uh, uh, quality of service, service level agreements, service continuity, uh, all of those tie into performance and reliability and all the rest. And the other thing that we need to underscore with the students, whether we sneak it into the courses or teach the stuff separately, is that the skills that we're teaching or the mindset that we're teaching, I prefer mindset to skills because skills have a short half-life. The mindset that we're teaching is technology independent. Some of, some of us have been around long enough to see radical changes in the technology, but the skills that we bring to bear, the mindset that we bring to bear hasn't changed at all. It's like teaching a course on programming concepts versus a course on a specific programming language, right? You want to have the concepts understood and they uh, get mapped to different programming languages which evolve and change and, you know, but the concepts have not changed that much. You, you still look. want your code to be well structured and you want it to be right. commented and you don't want them to use too many globals. Yes. And there Doesn't are matter many... which language you're using, it's true for all of them. Exactly. And yeah. the concept of a variable or the concept of pointers and such things, they are more or less stable. Right. right. I, I have again, I, I feel again that I have to play the, the, the negative role here. Uh, and and I'll, I'll give the caveat. In, in my classes, I do exactly this. And therefore, students complain about how tough the courses are. The, the reality, <laughs> I think, is... And again, we're talking uh, first year computer organization or things like this. The, the reality is that, in, at least in my view, the reality that I'm seeing, it may be a very biased uh, view, right? We, we talked about measurements and observations. Uh, the, the reality seems to be that, uh, especially in technical universities, students want to go out with a practical skill. And especially with bachelor's of science degrees, some sort of undergrad degrees becoming necessary to get a job, it seems to me that the students really do not want the, 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 the principles. They want something that ensures their path to the degree. And I find this very difficult, not because I cannot explain to the students what I see as necessary, but because the director of education questions me and people like us if the percentages of students who pass are below a certain threshold, whatever the number that, that seems fancy is that year, I don't know, these, these days like 50, 60% of the students. So, so, okay, I see David wants to say something maybe related to this, go ahead. Yeah, I was having a flashback to uh, when my daughter did uh, soccer when she was probably seven and she did a, um, she did a winter se seminar where they had coaches who came in and they ran drills with them for uh, for like seven weekends. And it was awesome because what they did was they ran the same set of drills, the exact same set of drills every weekend teaching the fundamentals of soccer to them. The kids experienced something completely different, which was the kids played a different game every weekend. Uh, this th one week they were pirates and there was some pirate theme game. Another one, like, you know, the kids had something completely different. Um, and not that you should teach your students like they're six year olds, um, but teaching the skills is fine so long as the thinking and the principles go with it. Um, and they don't necessarily need to know, I mean, it'd be nice that they knew, but they don't need to know that they're getting the principles. They, they probably want to know that they're getting the skills, but if the, the principles go in there with it, great. So I think one, one approach that we have followed in the context of programming, because it's a similar situation, um, one has to make a decision. You cannot just say, okay, we teach five languages at the same time. It's like they get completely confused. So one has a decision. You use one language as a, as a running example. We call it running example to illustrate. 
However, the concepts are introduced generically and also examples in other languages are given from time to time. For example, you have a slide, you have a program on the one side, it's like in Java, which is the main running example language. And on the second side, it's in C++ as a kind of secondary example. Uh, this, this kind of thing communicates the concept while at the same time gives them a chance to focus on one language. It might be Python, it might be Java, it might be something else. So similar here, maybe one takes one modeling approach in performance. I don't know, one stochastic modeling approach and uses this as a, as a running example. But at the same time, here and there introduces examples from other approaches to show that there are also other ways to do it. And then also the concepts probably would be better communicated this way. It might confuse them, of course. So there will always be students that are disturbed by this. You know, they would prefer not to have the other example, just a single one, right? Uh, 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 great, just classical example I can give you. You put, you know, uh, a Java code, right? And you put C++ code and uh, you, you show something to do with references. You now the Java reference compared to the C++ reference, if a student has understood this and the difference, he must be really a champion. All of them get confused. At the moment you show a C++ reference, they confuse this with pointer, with Java reference. It's like you mix everything together. So it's really counterproductive. But if you pick the examples properly to avoid too much kind of over challenging them with such really tricky low level details, I think the effect is positive generally. I mean, our evaluations of, on this course are actually very positive despite all of this multi-language approach. Do you have a specific recommendation, Sam, for me to write? Well, this was commenting basically on the discussion, but I have another recommendation coming back to the initial list you showed, I think on the second point, there was this wiki, I assume you talk about Wikipedia here, right? Wikipedia, yeah, yeah. okay. I want to mention this, my, okay, my, my own experience with Wikipedia is horrible, sorry to say that, but it's like everything I try to edit, they immediately kill me, right? It's like something is here, something is there. So it's like all positive content is like filtered out. So I had some negative experience, but maybe it was exception. Maybe some others are more lucky. I do think that Wikipedia plays a significant role here because when students are interested in a given topic, they Google very often and very often Wikipedia page comes in. And if this page appears to be fresh and it's like nicely written and it has references, they immediately think, oh, this is important topic. This is important topic. I must probably know about it. If it's some very old page where you notice no activity, some very uh, outdated sources, immediately the impression is, oh, who cares? I don't care about this topic. So I think Wikipedia as a way to also additionally push the topics we do like performance engineering, uh, all of these also in uh, interesting subtopics. If we update these pages, I think this would help the community better also Mm -hmm. uh, yes. accept the topic but it's a challenge as I said my experience personally it's like I had a, an article written with five, uh, 50 references 50 references 5-0 comprehensive article written for Wikipedia and it included maybe three four from where my name was also on the list I was killed like self-promotion come on mm -hmm. most of the people it was like I counted 100 authors that I cited. Most of them I don't even know, but I'm self-promoting myself because there was an article included yeah. that also included my work. So, hello. It's like... That think... the joys of large feedbacks. <laughs> That's the pitfall of doing work where no one has gone before. It's like if you write about a topic, normally, of course, the assumption is if you're taking the time, of course, you probably have also done also something in this area and the chances mm -hmm. that you might have participated somewhere are high, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Wikipedia seems to encourage people writing that have no idea about what they're writing. They never did anything in the area. They know nobody and they are writing something. And this, of course, 
encourages bad content, right? Which is a challenge now. How do you get the experts to write without running into some supposed mm -hmm. artificial conflict of interest suspicion? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, any other comments from the Slack that we should capture here? Anybody that puts something on Slack, any questions, comments that are not captured in this list? I was just going to call um, the comment that he put in if uh, unless they wanted to speak up them, themselves about tying the, the skills, the concepts to, to practice, um, which I think is probably a good counterpoint to what I had said before. Um, you know, illustrating the concepts through practical things, that, that's just great. That's, that's goodness, right? There's no shortage of uses of sharding and replication and, and things elsewhere, um, so long as the, the principles are in there. Mm -hmm. Anything else, guys? Yeah, so I'm trying to do, I, I don't know if we should do this now or to try to merge offline, Alberto, but if we try to do this now, I'm trying to list the items. There's an entry called issues, it's quite long. And I'm trying to copy the items that uh, seem to be outstanding, as in that they've not been included. So one is that this is a multidisciplinary field and that raises special challenges on how to educate, how to teach. Uh, the, the reason is that simply you can't say, hey, here is the book on methods and, and here are the top five methods and just use these. Uh, there are different things, different understandings, depending on which field you want to cover. And they might be really big bodies of methodological bodies. So, so OK, yeah, that, that also works. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Bigger monitor, Connie. Very good. So yeah. probably... we might want to remove the names if we think that uh, that that yeah. these items are too contentious, especially if we want to to use these for broader dissemination. But uh... yeah, we do, yeah, we probably can uh, we can remove the names, right? Yeah, yeah. Alberto, can you bold the font, please? That'll yes. make it easier for us to read. That's what I think. Hello, Siri is interfering here. Yes, Andre. Can you bold your fonts, please? It'll make it easier for us. Okay. Let me just please. Uh, get uh, yes. Bold. Ah, much better. Thank you. I, I think the last item did not get copied, which is if we can provide something clear for lifelong learning. So if, if the concepts are very complex, then, then teaching them will always get stuck at the introductory course. Whereas at some point we really want to bring back into the, the current understanding of, of what this stuff is. We want to bring back the experts from the industry or people who have already done this for many years, but they don't know the latest developments or they want to catch up or they want to switch tracks. So they may be building, developing, doing all sorts of related things, but they want to learn performance uh, engineering. And the question is, can we provide this? And I know a lot of universities are starting to turn to this uh, lifelong learning uh, process. It's a source of money, it's a source of prestige. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, lifelong learning, yes. So it was uh -huh. there, but it was hidden. So this is the time when we propose a social event or? Yes, so we don't have a social event, but uh, we could propose it here. So how do you get, because one of the best things from uh, workshops is after the workshop is over, we go meet with people <laughs> and have ideas and set up collaborations and go for dinner and beer and things, <laughs> right? So how do you set up those collaborations now? We have well, we are, last year we unshared the screen and then we just sat around and talked while the channel was open. Sorry, about point, sorry, may I speak? Sorry, yes. without uh, 
raise my hand by life. Okay, this is my true and excuse me. No, no, uh, put on the list, please. What you want? Excuse me, Alberto. What do you want? Uh, the list, the list of the okay. Uh, point uh, 11. Yeah. I was not speaking about tools. Uh, so I, I, I don't know the meaning of tools here. What do you mean with tools? Since there is a yeah, so I think about meaning. Yeah, so I, I think these are the, the conceptual tools, their various methods. Um, to... Yes, not tools about. No, no, not, not practical. Uh, okay, okay, Do okay. I need no, to. Th so no, no. We have call them techniques. Point... Techniques. I'll call them techniques. Techniques I'll go rather into... than tools to make the distinction. Yes, it's better. Thank you. Yeah. I see the confusion. A generating function is a tool. Tools, so is Some people use the word mathematical tools, but I would rather change it to techniques rather than tools. Is that good? Okay. Okay, so, so yes, we can uh, hang out and uh, do social networking for a while here, right? If somebody that's interested. Huh? Or, so today is a short day, right? In terms, this is the only Activity for ICP today? Do you have anything in the schedule in addition? No. Well, some of us are, are ending the day, so for us it's fine, but others, especially in the US, they're starting the day, so we cannot break the no, champagne no, no. glasses. And... Yeah. The day is not ended. My talk is there at two o'clock, so I expect all of you to be there. Two o'clock right. Eastern time. Two o'clock Eastern, right. Yeah, uh, hour and a half, hour and a half. Okay, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. It's in the workshop called LTB, load yeah. testing oh. and benchmarking. I did not know I was doing testing and benchmarking, but I am doing now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I told them first, I haven't done anything along those lines, and then he showed me some of my papers. So then I had to say, okay. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm serious. It will be interesting. It will be interesting. Okay, yeah, so, work very hard. This is the first time I'm giving this that talk. I work so very my, hard. My research topic currently is how to inject uh, software performance anti patterns in real systems or in models of real systems, right? To try to characterize. Uh, the behavior. So, so the idea is how to develop a tool to automatically detect software performance anti-patterns. So basically you want to identify software performance degradation. Can somebody turn off? Can you stop sharing? Then we can see more and more of us. Yeah, I, Alberto, could I ask you to capture the bit about the uh, target sites, please? About what? The target testing sites. Things at which we can throw, lo throw loads so students can measure. Yeah, I had that. Oh, yeah. you did? Okay, great. I captured that while we were talking, right? Okay, lovely. Uh -huh. Thank you. I would like to see some younger people uh, participate, uh, ask questions, show their faces. I'm young, I'm, I'm already here, but I'm talking about the others. <laughs> Yes. So I, do I count? I'm younger. <laughs> Ask a question. Thanks for the workshop, comment. everybody. It was a very cool discussion. I've been uh, listening intently, trying to formulate something smart to say, but didn't add too much to the discussion as of yet. Yeah, so, so there was a discussion here about uh, fault injection that Sam brought up, right? This is the work uh, in Coimbra that Marco Vieira and Nunes, they yes, do. Yes, exactly, exactly. And the question, so what I'm trying to do in my research is to inject performance problems. And there was an effort called dependability, dependability benchmark for quite, uh, quite some time um, connected with that, connected mm -hmm. with that. 
So your fault injection, error injection is a very a mature field in the hardware context. In the software context, it is, I think, called mutation testing. And, and Sam, that's where I was asking a question about benchmarks, because what I want to do is to create a, a, a bare bone system, but I cannot install a telecommunication system, right? I don't have access to a real complex system. So what I need to do is to to, bank, to create a benchmark to, to, to be a model of that system, right? And then to inject the perform the software performance antipatterns into that benchmark. Right? Exactly. It's a right? very, very typical approach nowadays in different domains, not so, only in the reliability community, but right. we use it basically. This is the scenario I was uh, referring to when you use basically a benchmark as an abstract yes, uh, representative of a given type of applications. Uh, so that you can more flexibly work with it. For example, you can adapt it easily. You can mm -hmm. ex extrapolate to different scenarios. And we actually, just to give one example, we built this T-Store. It's like a, a kind of benchmark reference application for microservices. Mm -hmm. And uh, the argument was exactly the same. Basically, instead of using a real microservice oh, applications, you use this store which is like uh, designed to be somehow like similar a, okay and it's used for research purposes so people come and adapt it for example scale it up or right. you, you might take for example t store or better to just one idea you right. take this t store because it's used also in the community and you inject for example performance anti-patterns inside it yeah the problem is those things like sock shop or train ticket of t stores they're very small things like they don't it's hard to tune this to, to represent a real system, right? How, so the right. question is, how do you make it realistic? Right? We have, of course, kept the size limited, you're right. So it's not okay. like it has thousands of microservices. It's not like Netflix, right? Oh, yeah. But uh, you're right. I mean, one could either uh, scale it up by having multiple instances of these services with different configurations. So that's one mm -hmm. approach. I mean, one could take each microservice and use it as a, as a base for generating multiple variations of it, yeah. right? And this way you can generate many variations. That's one approach. But of course, another approach would be to build a bigger benchmark with, I don't know, maybe 500 microservices. Then the, there is a trade-off here between how realistic are you and how uh, difficult it is to work with it, right? Right, right. I was thinking of going the other way, move to a smaller hardware configuration so you hit the hardware constraints mm -hmm. sooner. Right, exactly. You try to teach people to think. You want them to have to rut, walk before they can run. Teaching them on a smaller system has a lot of advantages. And one of the approach you're doing at Ericsson is to, for each software performance anti pattern, define how to constrain the resource, exactly what you're suggesting, right? Mm -hmm. To like, if, if you want to do a traffic jam, so you reduce right the CPU right number of CPU, uh -huh. CPU this is, this is what I did in my favorite muse my favorite problem the museum checkroom problem when I was doing both simulation and modeling. Mm -hmm. I made the uh, I made the resource pool artificially small, so that mm -hmm. the system would crash sooner. Right. Alex, you want to say something? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the conference. Uh, I just wanted to say mm, something about uh, T-Store because I was using it. I was like finding some performance issues with it. And the biggest problem with such kind of application is that at this point, at least, T-Store has just one committer. And is, as with Acme Air, as with, um, uh, well, socks uh, shop with like every this uh, like benchmarking application. It's really hard to actually maintain them. We have already like several of them, and we don't have like any one up to date. So like it may be first step as for community to actually teach people for performance engineering, like coming up with the application that we can support, that we can like say that this is. Uh, community supported application for performance engineering. So 
Or you could make it community supported otherwise as well. It's a good opportunity to teach people about maintenance processes. You mean like by creating another one? Uh, cre creating another course uh, or creating a, creating some kind of some kind of course or workshop in which you cover operational issues. So there's yeah, a synergy yeah. between the two. You're doing it for the sake of causing problems, but at the same time, many, very often operational changes have to be made because of performance issues that arise. And uh, there are tools out there for configuration management and so on. Uh, that deal with version control and things like that. And you have network management tools that roll stuff out. And that's the sort of thing that people are going to run, it, run into an industry that you're not going to hear about a university setting. And this might be a good way for them to find out about it on a small scale. Yeah, well, that's my plan. And as for like industry standard, it is ECMA Air still. Uh, in Istio, at least they are using it. In IBM, they are using it so... I guess that's the most wider, like, uh, adopted application. Mm -hmm. So, so Alex, uh, maybe you can catch up later to make sure all the the recommendations and summary are consistent, right? You can have that offline. Yeah. Um, if, yeah. if you can please uh, share with me Are or we, even with upload what I have to the to, to yeah. the slide. Exactly. Exactly. If you do this, then I can uh, then I can have a look and we can uh, keep right. iterating on this. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So, I think it's time to thank everybody, all the speakers. It was a great workshop. I really enjoyed a lot of the talks and discussions. That was really nice. Thank, thank you to the organizers. Yeah. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much. Great Thank workshop. You. It's always a very nice experience. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Great start to the conference. It's a good exactly. Start. Okay. So thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. It's great bye, to bye. be among friends. See you tomorrow. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Very nice bye. to see some of the people after a long time. Yes. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Maria. Bye. Manoj, Manoj you're not showing yourself for, for some reason. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm muted. Vittorio. Ciao, Kishan. How is it going? Victoria, Vittorio. Ciao. Ciao. Andre. Bye bye. Next year in person, I hope. I hope too. This way is impossible. We try to do the best, but it's impossible. But, uh, this way. We, we, we had uh, very good attendance. Most we, we end up up uh, to 35 uh, people. And uh, most no, of but, the, but the key point is the Kishers one. We miss jokes. I mean, definitely. I mean, yeah, uh, there is no no, yeah, it, everything it, is possible. Uh, it's very difficult to find the right time to joke, you know, uh, yeah, especially yeah, for me. It's really difficult. So, mm. but also the jokes are being recorded. That might be a little bit inhibiting. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, it's part of the of the game. <laughs> but the human oh. interaction that that stuff that's what you don't have. Joke is just one part of human interaction. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very important to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you later. Okay. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye. bye. Ciao. So bye. You have a recording of this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five. Yeah, it's a record and uh, I will stop uh, the record.